When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and I'm always grateful that you'd invite me over for scripture study. Uh, today, we have an adventure ahead because we're going to take on Broadway and Hollywood and see what we can do. By way of Broadway, I mean Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And by way of Hollywood, I mean uh, Joseph King of Dreams, that uh, animated DreamWorks movie, both of which I enjoy. But nothing beats the book, as usual. And so we're going to stick with Genesis and see what we can learn from the story of Joseph as he heads down into Egypt uh, through no choice of his own. This is a very famous story, and we end the book of Genesis with this. This is a two-weeker. Uh, Abraham deserved that, uh, and so does Joseph. And, and so between this week as he gets into Egypt and next week as the rest of his family comes to join him, uh, we're setting the stage for the Exodus that we'll get to and, and the history of Israel beginning to unfold. Uh, this story oh, is, a, is the capstone for this book of Genesis. And as Genesis is putting in perspective so much of, of our background, our history, and particularly of the covenant, we'll, we'll talk more about that next week especially. Uh, but I do pray that the Holy Ghost will help us see relevance in the story of Joseph beyond, well, beyond Broadway and Hollywood, like I said. Now, to get into this story, we need to back up into last week and get a running head start uh, to build some momentum. Because Joseph will be the focal point today, but he does have 11 brothers, and we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of them as our focus uh, shifts to Joseph himself. And that's the way chapter 35 ended. Remember last week, 36, we didn't spend time on, that's the genealogy of Esau. And the storyline in the, in the Bible doesn't follow his posterity. It follows Jacob's. Uh, and so to review that, which we saw at the end of chapter 35, uh, we see he lists his 12 sons. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. So setting it up already, realizing that that's where you would assume the, the birthright would go. And Simeon and Levi. We met them last week in some difficult circumstances. And Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. So there's the six sons of Leah. Next, the sons of Rachel. Joseph and Benjamin. Next, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, that would be Dan and Naphtali. And then finally, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padan Aram. And we could add, these are the sons of Jacob that he spent the rest of his life trying to induct into the family business. Uh, last week, bringing them into the promised land, and hopefully from this point forward, empowering them to go out and bring everyone else in the world into the promised land as well. This is the mission of the house of Israel. And we will see that personified by Joseph next week, especially as he makes sure that the bread of life is available to anyone who comes seeking it. Uh, that, that is, that, that is the family business. Okay. Now of all of those children, we met them last week. We got the stories behind their names. We, particularly saw what Simeon and Levi were up to after the rape of Dinah, sadly. We need to understand, though, a little bit more about Jacob's youngest son, Benjamin. He is Joseph's full brother, okay? The only other son of Rachel. And we didn't talk about his birth last week, uh, although it was in chapter 35. I wanted to save it for this week because his life factors in the story of Joseph uh, much more than anything we see of him on his own. And especially next week, that will, that will be important. But how's this for his backstory, his Genesis? Chapter 35, verse 16, the family is journeying from Bethel, right? Site of Jacob's ladder. And there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Now, I've never been through labor myself, but I imagine the phrase hard labor probably sounds very redundant to all of you mothers out there. I don't know if there's anything not hard about labor. And Rachel... Yeah, she's had difficulty all the way through. Difficulty getting pregnant. Uh, now difficulty in bringing forth this child. 
uh, I imagine many of you women can relate to Rachel. If you have had difficulty in getting pregnant or keeping the pregnancy full term or giving birth or challenges in lactation or challenges in raising those children, hard describes the whole process in many ways. That was the curse slash blessing upon Mother Eve, if you remember. That in sorrow, in suffering, in anguish, in travail, you will bring forth children. And that's exactly what's happening for, for Rachel. I, I hope that she's pa- past the point of comparison. As we saw last week, comparing herself to her older sister Leah, uh, to, who made childbirth seem so easy. Uh, at least what we have on the page. Six sons and a daughter. And yet here we have Rachel suffering and struggling through this. Now in verse 17, it came to pass when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Now those are welcome words of encouragement, I'm sure, but notice the midwife is only reassuring her about the life of her son. And perhaps we see why in verse 18. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. Now that has to be one of the most understated, dispassionate descriptions of, of death that you'll see in Scripture. Oh, as her soul was in departing, so it's not even its own statement. It's kind of said in passing. Oh, as this was happening, the baby came. And then to put into parentheses, for she died, almost like it was an afterthought. Oh yeah, I need to make sure I clarify that before we get on with our story. Now, I don't think there's any way that Jacob wrote that. Because for him, this is the wife that he loved so much that seven years felt like but a few days. This is the wife he kept at the back of the pack as he was facing Esau and fearing him. No, this would have been absolute devastation on his part, which is probably why he couldn't let the the name that Rachel chose stick. Ben Oni, son of my sorrow, I can't, I can't call him that. Because, especially if there's any family resemblance there, if he looks at all like his mother, then it's going to bring a certain pang of sorrow to Jacob's soul every time he looks at this little boy, knowing that he's missing his wife and that little boy is missing his mother. Yes, he is a son of sorrow. However, when Jacob changes the name to son at the right hand, I think he's saying something there. Because if you remember, Rachel was the wife at the right hand. And here's this boy that in some ways is meant to take her place, to fill that void for this father, this this suffering husband. To me, if I were to if I were to ask Jacob, how do you feel about the way the verse is, is phrased, I think he'd be devastated. But if you asked Rachel, I think she might say, Yeah, that sounds about right. My soul was in departing. Yes, I died. But a baby came into the world. And it's amazing the amount of self-sacrifice that goes into labor, hard labor and delivery and child rearing and everything else that a piece of every parent dies in the process of bringing a child into the world. And Rachel, I believe, would tell us it's worth it. it pass on. It's okay. Or let that part of life pass on. Let the ease of Eden go by the wayside. And don't even look back into the rearview mirror. Cherubim and the flaming sword are pointing you forward into a life of work, a life of toil, a life of sorrow. Yes, there's still Ben Oni out there. There is sons and daughters of suffering. But they're sons and daughters at your right hand. They, they're the reason we're here. That, that is the purpose uh, behind it, to pass on the covenant to make a difference in a child's, a child's life. And that's what Rachel has done in the ultimate example of, self, of self-sacrifice. I think often of my youngest, well, he's not the youngest, he's the seventh. In my wife's family, uh, she, her birth mother passed away when my wife was eight years old. Uh, she had been diagnosed with leukemia. And she passed away leaving behind a young husband with seven children, 12 and under. Uh, my wife was third. The youngest baby was a year old. And 
He never got to know his birth mother growing up. Thankfully, the Lord had raised up an incredibly brave woman willing to become instant mother of seven. And my father-in-law was eventually remarried. They eventually had three more children to give a total of 10. And I've never seen a more close-knit set of siblings than, than my wife's. They're an amazing bunch. But when I think of that youngest birth brother, and, and when his mother was diagnosed with leukemia, she was almost full term, but the doctor said, this baby has to come right now. And so a week later, she gave birth. And I imagine the greatest sorrow of her life was spending that last year of her life, which was the first year of her babies, being so sick that she couldn't be the mother that she, that she dreamed of being. Uh, I, I picture a Rachel here. The story is somewhat different. Uh, bringing this baby into the world is not what cost my, uh, my wife's mother her life. But, but there was a replacement of sorts. And like I said, that happens with every childbirth. A piece of the parent's life is replaced with that child's life. And like I said, Rachel would tell us all, it is worth it. And I think Benjamin would tell us all, make sure it is worth it. Live your life in such a way that your parents' sacrifice counts for something. And I can't think of a better example of that than this brother-in-law of mine. It's amazing what he's made of his life. Uh, the kind of testament that his mother and his father and his stepmother and all of his siblings are proud of. It's, he's an example to me, seven years younger than I am, but one I still look up to. And, and I, it makes me think of Benjamin. He lived his life, and we'll see more of him next week, in such a way that Rachel could be, could be honored that as she passed through the valley of the shadow of death, to bring Benjamin's life into existence, it was worth it. I pray that we children can make sure our parents feel that way about us. Now, verse 19, when Rachel died, she was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Now, that should tell us something about Benjamin. Again, his name means son at the right hand. He is taking the place of Jacob's wife at the right hand, Rachel. He is a miracle baby because this mother had a, had, it was nigh unto impossible for her to, to get conceive at all and hard labor bringing him into existence. He was a child, a son of sacrifice. And he was born in Bethlehem as his family had just left Bethel, the house of God. Sounding familiar? I mean, one of the purposes of the Old Testament is to provide types and shadows of Jesus Christ. The whole book is pointing forward to its fulfillment in Jesus. And we see a type of shadow of Christ in Rachel, who laid down her life to bring a new life into existence. Jesus taught similar things. Uh, if a seed has to die, in that form at least, to bring forth grain, and then he uses his own life as an example. So will I lie, lay down my life so that other life can emerge? Well, if Rachel is a type and shadow of Jesus, so is her son Benjamin. As Christ is a miracle child, a son of sacrifice, a son at the Father's right hand, born in Bethlehem, having just left the house of God. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out because Joseph today, our hero for the day, will be one of the ultimate types and shadow of Jesus, making sure that his family is preserved from famine by providing them the bread of life. Well, verse 20, Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. This is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. This sounds like something Jacob, just like his Grandpa Abraham always built altars everywhere he went. And like dad, Isaac, seems to be associated with wells everywhere. Uh, Jacob here, another pillar. He had set one up in, in Bethel to, to mark, to commemorate the base of Jacob's ladder. Well, here he is setting up another memorial to his beloved wife. And, and to think of this as another site of sorrow, but also another place of promise. Uh, stony griefs, and out of them I will raise a new Bethel. 
out of the sorrow of losing Rachel, I have the joy of bringing in Benjamin. And we'll move forward in faith from here. Now, from there, we need to make sense of the birthright because Jacob's family is now complete. As far as the 12 sons are concerned, which will then grow into the 12 tribes. Now, like I said, when we first introduced them, it reminded us, Reuben is Jacob's firstborn. So we would assume, that, okay, that's where the birthright goes. But don't forget, we've had some, some alterations to the norm already. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn, but Isaac was the birthright boy. Esau was Isaac's firstborn, but Jacob was the birthright boy. Well, Reuben is the firstborn. Why not make him the birthright boy? Well, we get one little hint back in Genesis 35. It tells us in verse 22, It came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. Now again, understated. Israel heard it. I can only imagine what he's feeling here. That what my son committed some form of incestuous adultery with, with my wife? What? Now this, thankfully this is Jacob. The same one who held his peace when he found out about the rape of Dinah, his daughter. Uh, he is holding his peace here as well. He heard it. We don't know of any action he took on the part. But we can see there a disqualification on Reuben's part for the birthright. Uh, and like we saw last week with Simeon and Levi's vengeance upon the people of, of Shechem. A, an unbridled passion in all three of these boys compared to the bridled passion of their father. So, Reuben disqualifies himself from the birthright through immorality, uh, the, the passion of lust. Simeon, Levi disqualify themselves from the birthright through unbridled passion, the passion of anger and vengeance and violence. Well, that leaves Judah as the next brother. And we'll see a story today where you can safely assume that he disqualifies himself from the, the birthright as well. But even if he didn't, particularly with plural marriage, the question of birthright comes down to if the firstborn of the first wife disqualifies himself, who does it go to? Does it go to second son of first wife or first son of second wife? Hmm. Work your way down. Does it go to Judah, son of Leah, or Joseph, son of Rachel? And thankfully, we have a very clear answer to that. Both of these boys will grow up and become very important in the family. Judah is the tribe that Jesus emerges from. That, again, this, this man of sorrows and acquainted with grief that had no form nor comeliness chose to come through Leah's line, which is interesting. The, the tribe of Judah, as we'll see next week in these patriarchal blessings, would bear rule in Israel. So there's political power there, but spiritual power would go through the tribe of Joseph. And that's where the birthright will go. Here's the text in question. Way far ahead, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. The chronicler is going through the house of Israel and describing the genealogy of Jacob. And he gets to Reuben here. And he says, now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. And then he gives you this long parenthetical insertion. And it clarifies so much for us. For he was firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. So there's political power. But the birthright was Joseph's. And that's spiritual power. That is leading the family in righteousness and bearing the mantle of the Abrahamic covenant. So I've always been grateful for that verse in 1 Chronicles because of how well it clarifies things. Where the, what will follow today is Jacob's, excuse me, Joseph's story. Although we will see a little bit of Judah's and we'll see why in just a moment. Well, let's dive in then. Uh, Genesis 37, we finally get the, the spotlight on, on Joseph himself. Now verse 1, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. And verse 2, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. Now, that's the first time we really meet him as more than just childbirth last week. And what's he doing? He's feeding the flock. 
with his brethren. Now talk about setting the stage and foreshadowing his role among the house of Israel. Uh, birthright, what's your job? Seed of Abraham, house of Israel, the family business is to feed the flock with your brethren. And the first time we lay eyes on this boy, he's doing just that, 17 years old. Now verse two goes on. The lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. So he's with his half brothers. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now this isn't an evil report from these brothers. It's an evil report about them. This is Joseph, whom his father trusts more than anyone. We'll see in a moment. And he comes back and, and lets him, his dad know what his other sons are doing out there with the flock. Now, we don't know exactly what that is, but it's an evil report. And this sets the stage for what we'll see later in this chapter, at least. Yes, Joseph is doing a better job at, at feeding flocks than his brothers are. But he makes sure his dad knows about it. And so we get a sense of a little bit of tattletaling going on. Uh, was it mean-spirited? I don't know. Okay, He's only 17, so let's cut him a little bit of slack. But how are his older brothers going to feel about that? This little brother telling dad that I'm not living up to expectations? Come on. Now, it's going to get worse here because verse 3 tells us plainly, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And we could probably add to that because he was Rachel's son. And if there was one thing we saw last week, it was the dangers of comparison. In fact, all four C's, right? Comparing, competing, complaining, criticizing. Well, we're already seeing all of this. Uh, Joseph complaining about the way his brothers are feeding the flock. Them criticizing him, no doubt, uh, for, for telling on them. Uh, competition and comparison between these brothers. And Jacob's not making it any easier. Uh, you would have thought he would have learned from his own experience being compared to Esau and Isaac and Rebekah plain favorites. You would have thought he'd learned from his experience with Rachel and Leah and their alternating pride from above and pride from below. Well, unfortunately, he is plain, plain favorites and, and has giving Joseph some preferential treatment, perhaps above and beyond simply passing down the birthright. But that is going to be a cause of contention between his sons. Now, the end of that verse, though, tells us the, the most obvious uh, exemplification, illustration of this favoritism, because it says he made him a coat of many colors. So here's the amazing Technicolor dream coat, finally. And it's so important in this chapter, it almost forms a character of its own. Now, to understand its significance, there's a few things we need to wrestle with. First is simply the, its name, a coat of many colors. At least that's how the King James translators gave us the, or rendered this passage. The, he, the Hebrew original doesn't necessarily require color. Uh, other translators suggest it might simply be a, a long-sleeved tunic. Uh, others describe it as a, a richly embroidered robe. We don't know exactly, but there was something to this. And the fact that Father gave it to Joseph alone suggests there's something going on here beyond just oh, fashion statements. Okay. Now, there is Jewish tradition behind the possibility that this, was, this may have been that coat of skins passed down that God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If this is a priesthood garment that is then passed down generation by generation. We saw that tradition rise up as a possibility in the story of Noah and Ham, or even in the poss a, a, a distant possibility in the story of Nimrod and the, and the Tower of Babel. But if that's what's happening, you can imagine after this many centuries, uh, this many generations, oh, something wears out here, or you get a hole in the sleeve there, uh, or a, a, a frayed hem somewhere, but replace that piece. Well, we're, now we got to replace this. And by now, has this priesthood garment, this coat of skins, become a, a patch here and a patch there until it's a patchwork quilt of different shades of leather? Oh, to the point it looks like a coat of many colors. That's a possibility. I mean, at least if the birthright is passing to Joseph, then this is a mantle of authority that is going from father to son. Uh, no wonder the other brothers, the o o other older brothers are bitter about this. Now, what if it is actual color? 
Uh, that's a possibility too, like I said. And, and there's some beautiful symbolism to that as well. Think of it as a rainbow reminder of the covenants of God. The promises he made to Enoch, that as Zion was lifted up, so will Zion return. That your coat, my son, is a reminder of that. You are to build Zion. So that Zion built can prepare for Zion brought. You're our next Enoch, our next Melchizedek. Or the, 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 the rainbow reminder to Noah that I will not flood the earth with water again. I will flood it with truth to gather out the elect from the four quarters of the earth to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. Well, Joseph, remember that every time you put on this mantle. There's, there's something beautiful about this. I'll even say, too, about color and many colors. Uh, my wife, I'll put it this way, I, people joke sometimes that I'm the monk and my wife is the gypsy. Uh, I would have been just fine wearing some kind of drab, unicolor uh, <laughs> cassock uh, in, in, my, in, my, in, in my monastery somewhere. Uh, white shirt and tie is just fine, and sometimes t the tie can be frustrating because I have to pick a color. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, absolutely loves color and as vibrant and diverse as you can get. Uh, you look at my side of the closet, it's all white shirts. Uh, her side, it is a, there are coats of many colors there. And in fact, I joke sometimes that I, I'll look at something she's wearing and I'll think to myself, I don't think that matches. But then I realize, well, I guess somebody did, th thought it matched, because it's actually the same article of clothing. It's not like shirt one color and, and skirt or pants the other. It's, no, that's just one dress that has all kinds of different fabrics and patterns and designs and, and colors. And, and it, my wife loves it and, and makes it look amazing. The, I, I don't know how she puts up with me. In fact, I guess I do. She buys me clothing for Christmas sometimes. First time she did, I'm like, oh, honey, I love it. I love, thank you. I'm, gr I'm great. I know the thought is what counts, but you know how many books we could have bought with that? I, that's all I really want. And she laughs and says, honey, it's, it's not a gift for you. It's a gift for me. I'm sick and tired of watching you, seeing you wear the same stuff you, you had before we even got married. Yes, guilty as charged. Uh, but, but her coats of many colors serve as a reminder to me of one more symbol in this. Because that variety, that array, suggests to me from a covenant son the birthright boy in a family who is meant to bless all the families of the earth, right? In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Every family, no matter what shade, no matter what color. I'll put it this way. The coat of many colors is a reminder that every hue of humanity is welcome in the kingdom of God. And I pray that those of us who are bearing that coat in this day will never forget it. And no matter who they see and what color or stripe they happen to come from, do they see a reflection of them, of themselves, in the coat of many colors? Can they find their, their color here? Can they find their hue, their shade, their variation? Because it's all part of the covenant coat. I pray, my friends, that we can be a more welcoming kingdom of God. I pray that we can help people see in the fabric of our faith where they fit perfectly. This is a coat that no matter how many colors are part of it, they are all woven together into this incredible tapestry of truth to the point that everyone fits and there's room for all. I pray that they know it, and I pray that we can make sure that everyone does feel that way when they come into the kingdom of God. Now, with all of that, that talk of the coat, how do his brothers feel about it? I'm sure Joseph is thrilled, okay? But his brothers, verse 4, When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, I feel for Joseph here to have 10 older brothers that can't say a nice word, that cannot speak peaceably to him. I imagine more than ever now he misses his mother. 
one place, one soft landing spot of someone who thinks the world of him. Yes, he has his father, but so do all of these other half-brothers of his. Again, maybe there's an additional concern now for his younger brother, Benjamin. If they treat me this way, how will they treat him? Especially so young not to defend himself. This is a hard situation. And again, perhaps Jacob has made it harder. Perhaps Joseph himself has made it harder. Uh, but be, to be loved by one and hated by everyone else, this is a tough situation. Like I said, he may have added to the problem. Uh, verse 5, it says that he dreamed a dream, and we'll see that this is a distinguishing feature of his life. And they always seem to come in pairs. Here's the first half. He dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. So maybe you should have kept this dream to yourself, little brother. Here's what it is. He said to them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. So we're not just shepherds of the flocks, that's part of the family business, but we're also growers of the grain. We are the sowers of the seed. That's part of the family business too. Symbolism everywhere you look. Well, we're all binding our sheaves. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. That means to bow down before my sheaf. Mine was the one standing upright, the tallest of the, of the brothers. And all the others were bowing down before it. Now, you don't have to be a psychoanalyst to be able to figure out this one. You don't have to be an interpreter of dreams uh, to be able to interpret this one pretty clearly. And that's ex exactly what his brothers did. Verse 8, they said to him, Oh, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Well, like I said, that's only dream number one, and here's dream number two cl following closely on the heels. He dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren, like he didn't learn from the first time, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now this one, his parents, or his father and his stepmothers, I'm sure, perked up their ears because it wasn't just eleven stars like the, like the sheafs. There's a sun and moon here too. And so, oh wow, now it's the whole family, not just your siblings. Verse 10, he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? So again, it doesn't take much deep psychoanalysis for this. But I do wonder about that, that word rebuked. Is his father hating him the way his brothers are? I don't think so, because notice the next verse. His brethren envied him. And that envy turns into malice and hatred. But his father observed the same. So here again, you see Jacob, true to form, holding his peace, as we saw with Simeon and Levi, or hearing it and not acting on it rashly, like we saw with Reuben. Here he observed the same. Jacob's amazing, in terms of as a father, watching his sons grow and figuring them out, uh, trying to understand personality types and, and seeing what, what will come of all of this. He's not rushing to judgment. He's not jumping to conclusions. He's being patient and watching how things will play out here. And that's what he's doing with, with Joseph, which makes me wonder about that rebuke that we saw in the previous verse. It doesn't sound like this is a rebuke of anger or son, you're, you're being dishonest. I think he's just saying, son, careful, you're being unwise. It's not that I'm worried about your presumptuousness necessarily. But I'm, I'm a little concerned about your possible pride. Uh, I'm, I'm going to observe the saying and see what unfolds. Uh, but like I said, this is a 17-year-old. So let's be merciful and patient with him. He's got some growing up to do, just like his dad did uh, when he was a younger man. Well, I think we all do. His brothers certainly do, and we'll see that next. Verse 12, his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, that was the site of that massacre, uh, but a place of, where family solidarity was, was acted upon, in negative ways, obviously, but, 
we're defending the honor and virtue of our little sister. Well, how are they going to treat their little brother here? We'll see. Israel says unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. So join your brothers feeding the flock. See how they're doing with that. That will be part of that birthright boy's role going forward. Uh, On big picture, feeding the flocks of God. So verse 14, Jacob says to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. Interesting order there. I want you to check on your brothers and check on their flocks and herds. This is people over programs or practices. This is your fellow companions, your fellow servants in the work. How are they doing? We have responsibility there, not just towards the the people that we're trying to teach or serve. Now, Joseph goes to Shechem. If you look at the maps here, it's about 50 miles away. So this isn't just poke your head out the door and make sure that they're playing nicely in the front yard. This is spend several days on the journey. But he goes there, and by the time he gets there, there's no flocks or herds or brothers to be found. He asks around, and they say, oh, they went on to Dothan. Uh, So sometimes you have to go the extra mile to perform your father's work. That's going to be an important lesson for Joseph and the rest of us to learn as well. Dothan is another 15 miles away or so, so there's several extra miles for Joseph to, to, to go. Well, he gets there, and before he catches up to them, they see him from a distance. In verse 18, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So that's their ultimate or their original goal. We're, we're, going, he's, we're going to leave him dead here. They said one to another, behold, this dreamer cometh. So here is jealousy, envy, getting to the point of of anger, of hatred, of violence, of plotting their little brother's death. This is what we got used to in the Book of Mormon with Laman and Lemuel and how they felt about their little brother Nephi. This is the the Old Testament equivalent of that. And in another way, it's just an echo of the previous generation. Remember how Esau felt about Jacob? So angry about the lost blessing on top of the sold birthright that he's ready to kill his little brother out of, out of spite, out of anger? Well, now multiply Esau by 10, and you have 10 older brothers conspiring to kill Joseph. Verse 20, we see their plan. Come now, therefore, let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now, there's more truth to what they said there than they realize. Some evil beast... Oh yeah, it's going to devour him, but it's been devouring you ten for a lot longer. Call it the evil beast of envy, the evil beast of pride, the evil beast of hatred or of anger. Oh, this is a whole flock, a herd of of evil beasts. It's the natural man welling up in each of them. And that is a demon that needs to be exorcised. This is a beast that needs to be laid down, not, not your brother. But notice what they ended with. Oh, we'll see what comes of his dreams. Well, here's the irony. The very thing you're trying to avoid, you're propelling yourself into that exact future because of what you're doing here. And that's the irony of sin. It brings on the exact thing we're trying to escape from by turning to it. These negative coping skills that we sometimes turn to. My my wife, uh, working in addiction recovery, she sees it all the time. Uh, as the, th- the very thing people are using to try to escape their reality is forcing them into a far worse reality than they realize. And by, by doing what they're about to do to Joseph, it will propel him and them forward into the f- fulfillment of those exact dreams that they were worried about. Now we're going to see some specific brothers respond to this plan in specific ways. Okay? And primarily it's Reuben and Judah. And remember this because those two especially will factor in next week's lesson in important ways. So watch them here. Verse 21, Reuben heard it. He hears the plan. And he delivered him out of their hands. Now, not literally yet, because Joseph hasn't even caught up yet. But as they're discussing this, let's, let's kill him and throw him in a pit. Reuben's like, whoa, 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 wait, brethren, wait. He said to them, let us not kill him. So I've got to veto that part of the plan. 
He says to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness. I'm okay with that part of the plan. And lay no hand upon him. So there's Reuben's plan. But then we see this little insertion. Okay, We get to, we get, to get inside Reuben's head for a moment. It says that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. That's what's on Reuben's mind. So best case scenario, okay, this is a brother who's perhaps learned from his mistake uh, with Bilhah, who realizes, kind of like Esau, what I did marrying outside the covenant was, was a grief to my parents. And so I'm going to change and grow up a bit and, and be better in the future. And he was. Is Reuben going through a similar kind of maturation Perhaps. On the other hand, is he thinking of himself like, I'm the oldest brother, I'm responsible here, and if we come home with a tale of, of a, a Joseph's been slain, that's going to be on me. And so, no, I, I, I can't put myself in, in that bad light yet again. So let's do something, I mean, we can rough, rough him up a bit, we'll scare him to death, we'll throw him into a pit, okay? but we'll get him out later and drag him home. Uh, we'll appease my brother's anger. Now, who does that sound like? This person is innocent. He shouldn't be slain. But let's do something to satisfy the bloodlust of those that are crying out for his crucifixion. Now, do you know who I'm thinking of? Pontius Pilate is an interesting example of someone who, well, let's not shed blood. Well, well, let's only shed a little. How's that? Don't slay him, but scourge him. And then behold the man and hope that that has satisfied you enough that we can let him go. And yet, appeasement is not the answer. That, that only whets the appetite, it seems. And that's going to be the case here. But Reuben's plan satisfies his brothers. So in verse 23, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, he's finally arrived, they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it, which is going to be a dangerous detail when you're living in the desert. Uh, a pit with no water. How long are they going to leave him there? How thirsty will he get? How desperate will he grow? Will he start staring death in the face and worrying what will become of him? Well, again, the focus in that verse is on Joseph, but also on his coat. To take from him this mantle of authority and then decide what they'll do with it. Now, the next verse, they sat down to eat bread. No water for him, but hey, bread for us. That's all good. And they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. So well, maybe Dothan is on a trade route. Here comes this caravan, and they're like, oh, they're traders. They have all this, these things they're going to be selling later. Hmm. And all of a sudden, an idea pops into the mind of Judah, especially. Verse 26, Judah says to his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? I got a better idea. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Now, again, best case scenario for, for Judah, he's recognizing, okay, he is our brother. Well, half. He is our flesh. Well, half. So, yeah, Reuben's probably right. Slaying him seems a little over the top. But it's interesting what he comes up with and the way he phrases the question. What profit is it? In other words, if we kill him, what do we get out of it? A coat? Uh, well, maybe that's worth something. But... I got a better idea. We could sell him. Like, again, these traders just walk by and they're in the business of buying and selling. Why don't, why don't we join and get in, the, in, in on that action? We can, we can get a profit off our little brother's pain. Now, does this remind you of anyone? Again, if, if Joseph is the type and shadow of Christ, we see a little bit of Pontius Pilate in Reuben. Do we see a little Judas Iscariot in Judah? Oh, same name even. Interesting. Uh, and what profit can I get in betraying Jesus? And so he goes and seeks out his version of the Ishmaelites and gets his 30 pieces of silver. Well, 
Similar price in verse 28, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now 20 pieces for Joseph was the going price for a slave that was under age. And 17 or thereabouts, we don't know exactly how much time has passed since we first met Joseph at the beginning of the chapter. But he's young and 20 pieces of silver is the going price. For a, a middle-aged slave, say one that's 33, that would be 30 pieces of silver. And that's exactly what that later Judah, Judas Iscariot, received for Jesus. Now there are those that have quibbled over this verse and wondered, wait, it said the Midianites, and then it says the Ishmaelites, which are they? Well, <laughs> at the end of the day, who really cares? Uh, they are minor characters here. Uh, some have tried to make sense of this and said, oh, well, it's a mixed group in this caravan, a bunch of traders, some Midianites, some Ishmaelites. Uh, is, there, is it being redundant? Is there an overlap between them? Like I said, don't get bogged down in, in unnecessary detail, okay? So verse 29, Reuben returned unto the pit. So he must have left for a moment, probably to go check on the, the flocks while the rest of his brothers have been hatching this plan. But when he comes back, behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he, Reuben, rent his clothes. He returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? Now, notice how he phrases that. The child is not. That tells you something about the, the age gap here. From Reuben's perspective, what have you done? This is just a child. But was he more concerned for the child or was he more concerned for himself as being responsible for all the littler children? Because notice the pronoun that came, comes up twice. I, whither shall I go? Oldest son, feeling responsible. Yes, he saw the helplessness of his younger brother, but who's going to bear the brunt of the blame here? Me. And what will father think of me? I'm going to descend even lower on the family totem pole as a result. Well, now, whether it dawns on him or dawns on the rest of the brothers simultaneously, we've we got to do something because we're going to go home Josephless. Now, we could just avoid the whole thing, but then our father's going to spend the rest of his life probably looking for him, and, and maybe he'll find out what we did, and, and then we'll really bear the blame and the brunt of it all. Uh, what do we do? And so now, ah, oh, good thing we stripped him of that coat because we can do something with it. Verse 31, they took Joseph's coat. They killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Ah, oh, they, they, so they're feigning ignorance they're pretending that they have no idea. In fact, is this even the same coat? I don't know. I, I think I've seen those on sale and everybody's wearing them. I mean, it's the fashion of the day. No, this is one of a kind. But here they are pretending to have no blood on their hands. It's just blood on the coat. And boy, does that add a color to the coat of many colors. It is now a mantle of sacrifice. It is bearing the blood of something that has taken the place of their brother. Still more symbolism, right? But just to hand it over to their father, in fact, even the way it's phrased there, they sent the coat and they brought it to their father. Makes you wonder, could they not even show their face to their father? Do they send it ahead with servants who then present it to their father? Hard to tell. But where does that leave Jacob? Israel. Of course this is my son's coat. It's one of a kind, as was Joseph, and he's gone. To see the callousness, the lack of compassion on the part of these brothers, to see not just, not just Joseph and what he's going through, that fear that in the pit, that fear of being sold off, being dragged away and seeing his brothers disappear in the distance, but also the, the grief, the mourning, the devastation on the part of their father. I lost Rachel, now I've lost Joseph. You better believe he's going to hold on to Benjamin all the more tightly that we'll see that next week. But 
verse 33, here's Jacob's response. He knew it. Oh, yes, he knew it. He said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. And yes, that evil beast was jealousy, was anger, was pride. He said, Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And then the very next verse, Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Now mourned many days, I imagine that would be enough days for his sons to come to their senses. Enough days for them to realize the, the anguish they've caused and to confess their sin. But no, they never did. No matter how many days had passed. And then that other phrase, Jacob rent his clothes right after saying that beasts have rent my son to pieces. Now there's an interesting detail. We see three different reactions. I mean, there's a lot, right? All the brothers want him out of the picture. They are, all the brothers are filled with the evil beasts of hatred and envy and so on. But you see Reuben trying to appease out of uh, selfishness and a worry about how he's going to look in all of this. And there's Pilate for you. You see a Judah. What profit can I get out of this? There's a Judas Iscariot. But here you see a loving father rending his clothes over the rending of his son. And that du dual rending suggests a, oh, a willingness to take his son's place. His son was rent. I am rent. My heart has been torn apart. My clothes will now reflect that fact. If only it had been me, my clothing torn apart and bloodied by this beast. But no, it was my son. I would trade places with you if I could. Well, if we're using all of these stories as types and shadows of Jesus, then who's the father figure here? And as you hear Christ cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can picture the father wishing he could trade places, tearing his own raiment as he sees his son torn upon the cross. There is feeling here. There is love here. There is loss here. And I hope we sense that when we think of our Father in heaven. Verse 35, all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Remember that phrase from the story of Enoch? He said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. And thus his father wept for him. Refused to be comforted? Well, what's worse? The, his sons refusing to comfort him in the way that actually would have worked? No. Yes, they, they try. They rise up to comfort him, but not... They could have confessed their sin. They could have given their father hope. They could have tracked down the Ishmaelites slash Midianites, go, go down to Egypt, find him. Well, there's some foreshadowing there. That'll all happen next week. But the chapter ends with verse 36. The Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Now, I'm fascinated by Potiphar. We don't know much about him. And the way it's phrased there, officer, captain, now that could mean a military officer. It could simply mean a court official. And some have wondered exactly what, what he might be. There's even translations that describe him as a eunuch. And if a eunuch is responsible for the king's harem, or in this case, responsible for other parts of, of Pharaoh's uh, household, that might actually explain a little bit about Potiphar's wife, if he is indeed a eunuch in the literal sense of that term. We don't know, okay? There's a lot of guesswork here. But captain of the guard could also mean... Again, all kinds of different translations of the Hebrew trying to make sense of it. It could be chief of Pharaoh's bodyguards. It could be the chief cook or even the chief butcher. Slaughterer is a word in here. And so that some suggest, oh, chief executioner. Others, no, chief bu butcher. Either way, if those are right, here's a man who's accustomed to shedding blood. And all of that's going to factor in with the, the result of of what happens with his wife in chapter 39. So that first moment we meet him at the end of 37, we have to start questioning, hmm, how's he going to respond when he hears tale of 
of a slave seducing his own wife. Well, hold on to that because the irony of the narrative is we have to wait a full chapter before we actually get on with the story of Potiphar. And it's actually amazing how this is all set up. Now, literarily, the book of Genesis is a masterpiece. The Old Testament as, as a whole is. But what's interesting about the story of Joseph is we get an interruption here. Go from chapter 37 to 38, and you're like, wait, wait, wait where's Joseph? Go to 39, and it's like, oh, there he is. He's there in, in Potiphar's household. In fact, the storyline flows seamlessly if you skip chapter 38. Go from the end of 37, oh, you meet Potiphar. Go to the beginning of 39, and oh, there's Potiphar again. It's a seamless transition. Then why would you kind of cut open the narrative and insert this interruption that doesn't mention Joseph at all or Potiphar? It's a complete kind of out of left field interruption of the story. Or is it? <laughs> chapter 38 is fascinating because it's setting up chapter 39. Chapter 39 is one of the most famous stories in the Joseph uh, narrative because it's Joseph and Potiphar's wife, okay? Well, chapter 38 sets up 39 in what uh, the literary experts call a foil. A uh, foil is the sword that fencers use. Well, a literary foil, if you look at foils that are often like hanging on the wall, they're usually crossed on some coat of arms or something. Well, a literary foil is taking two characters or two plots or two, you know, just two uh, pieces of the story and crossing them. Does that make sense? Uh, so that the juxtaposition, the cross of these two characters brings out the difference between them. You see that in a Jacob and Esau. Okay? You see that in an Abraham and Lot. You saw that in the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. The, the scriptures as a narrative, as a, as a literary work, are full of these kinds of examples. And Genesis 38 provides a foil for Genesis 39. And, the, and Joseph's foil here is Judah. So turn with me to Genesis 38, and in the first five verses, you see Judah marrying outside the covenant, which again is a, a tragic tale because, come on, your, your dad worked for seven years, actually for 14, uh, to be able to marry inside the covenant. Uh, your grandpa, the ser your great-grandpa's a servant, had to cross the Middle East, basically, to go find uh, a wife for your grandpa. Didn't you learn anything from Uncle Esau, Judah? Come on. But no, he marries outside of the covenant, which is, again, some, some problems here as far as path, passing down birthright. But out of that non-covenant marriage, he ends up having three sons. His first he names Ur, which, in, if you just stick with the English, is kind of fun. Like, oh, oopsie, I, I erred. Uh, I made a mistake in marrying outside the covenant, but that's not what the Hebrew means. In fact, the Hebrew means to awake or watcher. There's son number one. Son number two, his name is Onan, which means trouble or mourner. And number three is Shelah, which means request or petition. As usual, some, a lot of symbolism in these names. I almost get a sense of, of Judah having this son outside the covenant, one that I can't really pass the, the, the mantle down to. Oh, am I awake to the consequences of my decision? Do I need to be more of a watcher to know the path that I should take? Well, he doesn't take it. Second son, Onan, trouble, mourner. Will, will my decisions be a source of trouble or mourning for me? And then Sheila, request or petition. That's an interesting one because here's what ends up happening. Verse 6, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Now, Tamar means palm tree. And in that culture, palm trees, especially date palms, are a source of sustenance. They are a provider of life. And that's exactly, exactly what Tamar will be in this story. But notice, she's married to, to Ur. Now, next verse, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Now, that sounds like swift justice, and it is, but don't get sidetracked. The story's not about Ur. It's about Tamar here. And for this, we have to understand a part of their culture. Now, we saw plural marriage as an example of their cultural priority on having children. We saw Sarah give Hagar to Abraham to make sure that posterity could come. We see 
uh, Rachel and Leah giving Jacob their handmaids as part of this familial arms race. It's all about posterity. And there's another wrinkle to this. If, if plural marriage is a possibility to increase the chances of childbirth, so is leveret marriage. Now, levir is a Latin word that comes from brother-in-law. And so leveret marriage has something to do with your brother-in-law. And this is the example in scripture where we see it played out most dramatically. According to the law of leveret marriage, now brace yourself for this. If you thought plural marriage was, was outside the box, well, leveret marriage is, is way out. The way it works is if a man marries a woman and dies before having children, then there's a problem there. Uh, that, that family line has ended and that father has no children to pass down the family line to, the family name. His name has been cut off in Israel. And so we got to think of something. We have to make sure that he can have posterity. And so leveret marriage comes in. The law of leveret marriage says the widow now needs to marry the brother-in-law, Lever, leveret. And their first child will actually belong to the departed brother who's already passed on. That way, it's almost like this surrogacy sort of a thing. Remember, uh, Sarah was saying, well, maybe I can have a child through Hagar. Rachel and Leah were using their handmaids as, as surrogates for themselves. Maybe I can have more children that way, right? It's their culture. But what's interesting here is that if that brother dies and there's any more brothers left, then the woman keeps marrying brothers-in-law until they finally have a child. Uh, Strange things. As I've tried to explain this to my students, there's four, I have three younger brothers. I'm the oldest son. We've, the four of us have an older sister and a younger sister. But of the four of us, if I died with no children, my wife would have to marry my younger brother. And if he died before childbirth, then she'd have to marry brother number three. And if he died, she'd have to marry brother number four. It, it gets really, really interesting. Okay. Well, it gets even more interesting than that. And we'll see that in just a second. Well, the plot thickens. Ur has, has died, and so now you have to marry Onan. And so she does and goes in unto him. But Onan, in some ways, is probably even worse than Ur. We don't know what Ur did wrong, but read Genesis 38, and it becomes very clear what Onan did wrong. I won't get into specifics, but I will explain it in this way. Wait, I'm supposed to take my brother's wife and raise up seed to him? Well, I'm not interested in the seed, but I'm okay of taking my brother's wife. And so he does go in unto her, but makes sure that she doesn't get pregnant as a result. In other words, I can satisfy myself and, have, and bear no responsibility in the matter. I won't have to raise a, a, a child, especially one that only counts for my brother's posterity and not for my own. You want to talk about about selfishness and selfishness mixed with sensuality. We saw that with Shechem already. Uh, we're going to see that with Potiphar's wife in just a moment. And okay, remember we're, we're literary foils. We have to understand this. So Onan becomes this horrible example of that selfishness and that sensuality. And he is slain by the Lord as well. Swift judgment. Well, Stick with the story. What's supposed to happen next? Third son is supposed to become Tamar's third husband. But Judah's not so sure about this. It says in verse 11, Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Sheila, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Uh, so, in some ways, this is a win-win for, for Judah, because he's like, can you go home and live with your parents for a while? Um, uh, out of sight, out of mind, but I'm really hoping that I can keep my youngest son out of your sight and out of your mind, because yes, technically, you should marry him. I, I should do that and keep the law in that way, but yikes, um, my sons are dropping like flies, and, and I'm worried about this youngest, um, so let's just... Let's just wait. He's young. He's young. And so I'll call for you and bring you back when it's time for when he's old enough to marry. And then you will all keep the law together and all will be well and you'll be able to raise up seed to my first son. Well, here's where the plot thickens. While Tamar is off at her father's house, Judah suffers a loss of his own. He's lost two sons. Now his wife dies. And he has a choice to make. What do I do from here as a widower? 
Well, at one point, he and a close friend of his are out of town shearing their sheep. And there's something about being out of town when you're away from people who, who know you or know the standards you should be keeping. And since he's away from all of that and, and nobody knows him and nobody knows what he might do, as they're out of town, he sees this woman at kind of the intersection or at a crossroads, a uh, public place, and she's veiled. And he thinks, he jumps to con a conclusion and assumes she's probably a, a harlot, a prostitute, uh, peddling her wares out in this public thoroughfare. Um, well, I'm a widower um, and I'm out of town and no one has to know, so why not? And he goes in unto her. Now, the, there's an interesting twist to the story that we'll see in just a moment, but this woman, they have to decide on price, right? And so he, she asks him, well, what will you pay me for this? And he says, oh, darn it, I don't have anything to give you right now, but I'll tell you what, um, I'll, send, I'll send a kid of the goats. Uh, you could start a flock of your own. How's that for payment? And she says, well, I need some collateral, first of all. Now, to make sure that you're actually going to pay me for my services, okay? And so, uh, what do you have that you can give me? And he ends up giving her, according to the text, a signet, bracelets, and a staff. Now, the translation there might be tricky. The signet is probably more of some kind of seal. You know, when you put your seal of approval on something, kind of stamp your ring into something, or some kind of uh, token to, to show this is who I am, and I agree with this, this contract, this oath. And then the bracelet, in other translations, it's some kind of a ribbon or a cord. And then the staff is like your walking stick. But it may all be the same thing. That if it's, here's my staff, later we'll see that that becomes a representation of the tribe that you're a part of. So this is who I am. And then this cord attaches to my seal, which is also who I am. So the whole thing is like proof of identity. You and I, often when we have to leave collateral for something. We'll leave our driver's license, for example, or a credit card, saying, I promise I will pay you, or this is who I am, and I definitely want that back, and so I'll come back and make sure I return it, uh, or return to you what you need so I can return to me what I want. Anyway, that's the, that's the plan, and so they go through with this. And Judah goes in to this unnamed prostitute, and she conceives. And he goes home, and she goes on, and we might as well end the story there. Well, no, because we actually know who this prostitute is, and she's not a prostitute at all. It's Tamar. Now, wow, she's out prostituting herself? Actually, no, and this is important to understand. Go back to verse 14. She put her widow's garments off from her, so she's still mourning two departed husbands. She covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So now do you understand what's going on in Tamar's mind? See, she's, she knows two things now. She knows, number one, Sheila's old enough to get married, and, she's, and I'm supposed to marry him. I'm trying to live the law. I'm trying to do what, I, what I'm supposed to do and raise up seed to my departed husband. But Sheila won't come. And, and Judah's behind this. He said he would send for me, bring me back. Well, she also knows that, she finds out, she hears that Judah is out of town on the way to Timnath. And so that's why she wraps up in this veil and goes and just waits there. Because here's the part of the law of leveret marriage I didn't mention. Here's that final wrinkle. After marrying all these other brothers-in-law, if they all die and there's still no posterity, since posterity is key, then what's this poor widow to do? The marriage of last resort is with her father-in-law. Yeah, uh, yikes. But that was the point of, of posterity. There's got to be a way to raise up seed. And by going into the father-in-law, then that departed son, it's still the same line. And, and the line can be perpetuated. Uh, the covenant, so to speak, can be passed down. Well, Tamar knows this. We'll see in a moment that Judah does too. But he hasn't fulfilled his part. He hasn't given Shelah to Tamar. 
and he certainly hasn't given himself. Well, she's going to take matter into her own hands. And so she goes. Like I already said this, but verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot. She doesn't proposition him. He propositions her. He turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. So it's clear here. She didn't seduce him. He propositioned her. And she, knowing that this is my father-in-law, who has refused to give me the son that I was supposed to marry, my only choice then is to go in unto my father-in-law. And that's exactly what I'm doing. She's done nothing wrong. He has done something wrong, though, because he doesn't know that this is, is fulfilling the law of leveret marriage. He is just seeking self-satisfaction in the wrong way, just like his son Onan had. We've got, we've got some issues here with Judah, right? But then notice what happens. As the story continues, he goes home and she goes back to her father's house. Uh, but then he's like, well, I do need to pay and I need to get my, my stuff back. And so that same friend, he wants to keep it all in house, right? So the friend knows about this, but nobody else does and nobody else has to. So, hey, friend, take this baby goat and go back to Timnath and pay, pay the prostitute. Make sure you get my stuff and bring it back. And it's just between you and me, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I've got your back. Well, he ends up going and he comes back to that same spot. And there's no woman there. There's no prostitute. And in fact, he asks around, anyone seen somebody here? And they're looking at him weird like, no, there's no prostitute here, okay? There never has been. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. And so confused, he's like, well, oh well. He comes back and explains it to Judah. And their conversation's really fascinating. It says in verse 23, Judah says to his friend, well, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Now, what's he saying there? When this idea of, I, I, I did send the kid. I tried to pay her, and it didn't work, uh, but... I can wash my hands of this and end up with a prophet. Huh. Sound a little like Judah's approach to life, like we saw when he sold his brother into Egypt? There's a prophet here. Uh, I got what I wanted uh, physically, and now I get to keep what I want financially. Excellent. Win-win. I got to, to do something I shouldn't have done, and I got away with it. Okay? I don't have to pay the piper because nobody knows. And even that word he used, well, don't go back. Let's just <laughs> leave it at that, lest we be shamed. If I get caught going back and like seeking out a prostitute, A, it's shameful what I did. B, I'd be a laughing stock if they realized, wait, you gave her your signet and bracelets and staff? Like uh, everyone can, she can... Let everyone know who came in unto her. That was really stupid of you. Uh, no, let's just leave it at that and she'll keep it and no one has to know it was far away. Uh, shame. Notice he's more concerned with shame than with sin. Notice he's more concerned with getting caught than doing wrong. Okay? Now, all that's going to be incredibly important when we turn to Joseph and Potiphar's wife in chapter 39. But before we rush ahead, there's one last thing we need to see in chapter 38. In verse 24, it came to pass about three months after. So by now, first trimester is over. She's starting to show more clearly. It was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. Well, more than he realizes. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Wow, talk about swift judgment again. Uh, but this time from Judah, not from God. There's no mercy here. Wait, what? she was unfaithful to my son? She cheated on my family? How dare she? Let her, let her be burnt. So there's no mercy. There's jumping to conclusions. There's that passion of rage to match his passion of lust. In fact, speaking of burning... Oh, let's burn her when he was the one burning with lust. Talk about hypocrisy. I'm going to condemn her for the exact sin I committed. Now, he doesn't realize 
just how appropriate the word whoredom or, or harlot was. But he's the one that's been prostituting himself. And so notice what happens next. This is amazing. Verse 25, when she was brought forth, they dragged Tamar in. She sent to her father-in-law saying, well, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and the bracelets and staff. And all of a sudden you can see the blood drain from Judah's face as he recognizes all those things. And everyone else would have recognized them too. The, that's, his, that's his driver's license. That's his ID. That's his signet and bracelets and staff. Yikes. Notice her word, discern, I pray thee. Judah, how discerning are you? You didn't recognize me under that veil. Did you recognize the consequences of your choice? Are you discerning when it comes to sin and shame? Are you discerning when it comes to choice and consequence? Are you discerning when it comes to the law that you were supposed to keep and you didn't even though you ended up doing it? I was trying to keep that law all along. Can you not see that? Can you not discern that? Oh, there's a cautionary tale for all of us. Can we be sufficiently discerning when it comes to sin or guilt or blame or hypocrisy or put it all under the big umbrella of self-deception? Judah has been deceiving himself and now it's totally out in the open. To the point that, verse 26, Judah acknowledged them, oh, there's an understatement, and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more. Well, that's for sure. He knows that he's been in the wrong. He admits it. He confesses it. And he realizes, ah, you were living the law of lever at marriage, because I was refusing to. That, that phrase, she hath been more righteous than I, that's for sure. Well, as a result of it, she's pregnant and she gives birth to Judah's child, which now is supposed to be Onan's, excuse me, Ur's child, the firstborn. But this is where it really gets interesting because she has twins, just like Rebecca did, right? And just like in Rebecca's case, those twins wrestling in the womb and then the firstborn comes out, but... It's the second born that will end up ruling over the first. Well, echo, we see the same thing happening here. Verse 28, it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first. Now this midwife, it must be impressive. She must be lightning fast. Uh, not just ready to deliver the baby, but ready to tie a, a scarlet thread on the hand of whatever pops out first uh, to identify firstborn. Now, how does she know there might be a secondborn? I don't know. Was this something they did often? Uh, was Tamar so great with child that they assumed that there might be two in there? She didn't get a, a divine ultrasound like Rebecca did. But regardless, this, this baby, the, birth, the firstborn, the birthright, has this scarlet thread. But then notice verse 29. It came to pass as he drew back his hand. So it was like, wait, what? This poor midwife. Where's the baby? And then it says, behold, his brother came out. And she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Pharaoh's, which means breach or breakthrough. And afterwards came out his brother that had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah, which means to rise or break out. Now, this is a wild birth. Uh, the two were wrestling in the womb. Well, it sounds like it. And quite the wrestling match, since what to, to the victor go the spoils, right? Whoever comes out first gets the birthright. And so... I mean, if you want to over-dramatize this, you have this wrestling match and one bit brother is able to extend his arm out into the open air where the, the, the midwife is quick to crown the, the champion, uh, silver th or scarlet thread around the hand. But then this little brother, it sounds like Jacob at the heel, right? Little brother grabs big brother and, and yanks him back in. Like, no, you can't beat me like that. And the brother is able to s pull the switcheroo and come out first. Like, ah, I made it. 
And then the other brother comes out and says, oh, no, you didn't, because I still have proof that I emerged first and therefore emerged victorious. Again, wild story. Talk about the importance of the birthright, uh, as well as the importance of posterity to begin with. It's all right there. That's wild. Now, what's interesting, though, uh, two things that, uh, about this story that are important when it comes to Jesus and not just important when it comes to Joseph. The importance with Joseph is that literary foil of what are you going to do in the face of immorality, Judah, and what are you going to do in the face of it, Joseph? But in terms of its connection to Jesus Christ, it's actually really interesting because Jesus ends up coming through the line of that second-born son who was the first to fully come out into the light of day. Now, this might be more important than we realize because the firstborn, the, the technical firstborn, is going to belong to Ur, who is a son born outside the covenant. Whereas the second son, if I understand this correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand this correctly, the second son, the first is the one that belongs to the, the departed brother-in-law. The second would then belong to the, the actual biological parents. In some ways, I wonder if this second son is giving Judah a chance to, to reboot, to begin again, to actually have a son that came into the world uh, not outside the covenant like Ur did. Because the second son would belong to Judah, whereas the first son would belong to Ur. Which makes this second son straight out of the loins of Judah himself. And it's from that line that David would come and Jesus would come. That's interesting. That Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. That he is an interest, a miraculous birthright. And how on earth could you be the first one out of your mother's womb? and not be birthright son, that seems impossible. Well, no more impossible than a virgin giving birth. Well, it, this is not a virgin birth uh, in Genesis 38, but it is just a miraculous story. And Jesus' birth was the ultimate miraculous story. There's birthright coming in miraculous ways. Now, even more importantly is Tamar's role in all of this. Because, man, it looks like you did something wrong. But you didn't. You were living the law. You were keeping the commandment. And that's how your miraculous pregnancy uh, took place. Now that's going to be really important to Matthew, uh, the, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. Now Matthew was a Jew writing to fellow Jews, and he made sure everything he put in his story would resonate with a Jewish audience, including chapter 1, which was genealogy. True to form, you got to, to give somebody their genesis. And so Matthew 1 is the genesis of Jesus. And he, it passes down father to son, father to son, from Adam all the way down to Jesus' stepfather, uh, Joseph. And it's this kingly line through the tribe of Judah. Now, it's always father to son, father to son throughout this genealogy, except for four women named. The, and then a fifth, namely Mary. So it's always, and he begat him, and he begat him, and he begat him. Oh, through her who then begat him, through him, through him, and his father, 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 son, son, son. Oh, from this mother. Now, of course, every generation, there's a mother involved. Duh. Then why would Matthew only mention these four women? Well, notice who they are. Follow it through in Matthew 1, verse 3, Judas begat Pharaohs and Zerah of Tamar, woman number one. Verse 5, Salmon begat Booz, that's Boaz, of Rahab. Rahab will meet in the book of Joshua. There's the second woman. Verse 5, and Booz, or Boaz, begat Obed of Ruth. We'll get a whole book on Ruth. That's the third woman. Verse 6, David, we're skipping generations here. David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. There's Bathsheba. But he doesn't even call her by name. He wants to make sure that you don't forget this was a bad situation. This was, she was actually the wife of Uriah, and David took her to himself. And then you skip a bunch of generations. And then finally, verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. 
Now, why mention these five women? Particularly, why mention those other four? Well, there's a common thread, and it's not the scarlet thread on, on her son's wrist. It's the thread of common circumstances that are easily misjudged. We'll go through each of these women's story as we meet them one by one, but Tamar, look, you looked like a prostitute. I wasn't. I was keeping the law of lever at marriage. Tamar, excuse me, Rahab, runs a house of ill repute in Jericho. Oh, but she's the only one valiant, righteous enough to recognize the, the spies from Israel and protect them, put her life on the line for their sake. She recognizes the God of Israel and, and converts, essentially. So yeah, bad reputation, but actually a righteous woman. Ruth, we'll get into her story. There's a scene in the book of Ruth that seems a little scandalous as she lies next to Boaz, but there's, there's no evidence that anything wrong was done. The, huh, interesting. And then the final, Bathsheba, yes, something wrong was done, but not by Bathsheba. Would she have had any choice in the matter? This is the king requiring you to come in unto him. That's fault on David's part, just like here was fault on Judah's part. But no fault on Bathsheba's and no fault on Tamar's. Ah, now do you see the common thread? These four are women that the neighborhood would wonder about. That at first glance, you would assume that they've done something wrong. But no, dig into the story. And there's no fault here on their part. They were doing what was required of them. In fact, they were keeping the law, especially in Tamar's case. So get to woman number five, Mary, who is probably the talk of the town back in Nazareth as she is great with child, before marriage. And here's Matthew reassuring his Jewish readers, don't jump to conclusions. Don't disqualify Jesus on Mary's count. Mary was just following the family example of looking like you'd done something wrong when you hadn't. Mary is an innocent mother here. This is a virgin birth a miracle. And so don't misjudge the mother of the Son of God. Amazing stories, right? Well, that goes on to Jesus, but let's go on to Joseph, okay? Because 38 ends with all of that, and then 39 picks up right where we left off back at the end of 37. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Which, like I said, if we don't understand the, the literary foil, we're wondering, what on earth was chapter 38 about? Why did we get distracted from the story? Well, no distraction at all. As we see Joseph enter Potiphar's home, keep Judah's immorality in mind as we come to one of the great chapters in Scripture about the importance of morality and staying virtuous in, in the face of possible immorality. We're just a few verses away from that. Well, verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. The Lord was with him. His family couldn't be, but God could. His brothers didn't follow him down to Egypt, but the eldest brother did, the Lord in this case. And he prospers him. Now, he's a slave, but he's prospering? God is with him? This is a slave that sure doesn't seem like one. And that is something we'll see over and over and over. He doesn't seem like one because honestly he doesn't act like one and doesn't perceive himself as one. I don't need the coat of many colors on my, on my back to, to know who I am and whose I am. I, I know that I am the birthright son of, jo of Jacob. I know that I am the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that I am the bearer of the mantle of Israel. I'm no slave. I am one of God's people, and God will remain with me no, no matter where I go, and he will prosper me. Now, Potiphar sees this. It's obvious to all. Just like Laban realized, wow, God is blessing me because of you, Jacob. 
uh, Abimelech realizes, wow, God is blessing us because of you, Isaac, and then later Jacob. There's, there's power here, and it's recognizable to other people that God seems to, to be blessing you and blessing me as a result of my association. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Talk about the Midas touch. But here Potiphar, in a way, is coming to know of Joseph's God. He knows that it's the Lord that made all these things to prosper in his hand. He sees the hand of the Lord upon him. It's like, wow, who, who is this guy? Where do you come from? Who is this God you worship? Because, wow, he's blessing you and all of us as a result. Again, sound like Sarah being brought into Pharaoh's harem or into Abimelech's and the hand being stayed each time. That gave Pharaoh a chance to come to know Abraham and Sarah's God. It gave Abimelech the, the same opportunity. And now Potiphar is learning some of these things and the hand is being stayed. Joseph is not suffering as a result of this. In fact, verse 4, Joseph found grace in Potiphar's sight. He served Potiphar, and Potiphar made Joseph overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So, like I said, a slave that didn't perceive himself as one, well, here's a slave that isn't treated like one. I'll put you on my level. I'll let you run the, the household, uh, and, and I trust you completely with all that is mine. In verse 5, it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. No wonder, verse 6, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Now those last two uh, descriptors speak of his physical attributes that he was handsome, that he was well-built. But far more than that, he's one that everything he touches turns to gold. And, and Pharaoh, excuse me, Potiphar is willing to step away and just, you have free reign in my household. I don't even need to know. I don't need to keep tabs on you. No supervision needed. As long as I see the bread in front of me when it's dinner time, I'm good. Because I know that your God will bless me and all that pertains to me because of the way you are. That's, that's amazing. Well, he, Potiphar seemed to notice the first half of that verse, that everything you touch prospers. Potiphar's wife seemed to notice the second half of the verse. You are handsome and well-built, because here's where the story truly becomes that literary foil for Judah. Verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. Now we see the end from the beginning. First words out of her mouth, as far as we see in this story, is, is what she's rushing toward, which is straight up adultery. Lie with me. But notice, I've often asked my students in this, uh, about this verse, what's the worst sin you see in verse 7? And they, it's obvious, right? well, she uh, propositions him. She tries to seduce him. She wants to commit adultery with him. Okay, that, you're right, easy. That was the worst sin. But what was the first sin? Because worst sins always grow out of first sins. This doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it's the boiled frog analogy, right? It's the poison by degrees. How does she get to this point? And, and that's when they look a little closer and realize, ah, she cast her eyes upon Joseph. You remember the, the evolution of sin that we saw back in, in Eden, where Eve is looking at the fruit and it became pleasant unto her eyes? Well, here's, I'm sure that Potiphar's wife saw Joseph many times before she really started to cast her eye on him. And then he became pleasant in her sight. And all of a sudden, it escalates and elevates to the point where adultery is on her mind. To, it, to avoid worst sins, we have to, to nip first sins in the bud. And she doesn't do it. In fact, the idea of it's her eye that leads her into this, we see this in a different chapter 39, Alma chapter 39, where 
Alma's son Corey Anton has broken the law of chastity on his mission. And dad speaks of the lusts of the flesh, but he also talks about the lusts of the eye. That's where it started, son. You have to be careful. She cast her eye. Well, that's an interesting one because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about casting eyes also, but casting eyes away. He says, if you're right, I offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Because it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two. Oh, desperate times call for desperate measures. Cast your eye out. Yikes. Or, a little softer, take Job's word as his friends are accusing him of adultery. I mean, you're being punished as if you sinned, so you must have sinned. What did you do wrong? Was it, was it some sin against morality? And I love Job's response. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? <laughs> you see that? I covenant. My eye and I, we made a deal. That it wasn't going to wander. That I, it, I wasn't going to cast it in areas that it shouldn't go. Or I would cast it out. And so it knows to behave itself. Oh, if, if only we could train ourselves with that kind of self-discipline. And make sure that we are not casting our eyes in directions that they should not go to keep first sins from becoming worst sins. Well, now it's on Joseph. What are you going to do? Now you know what she's after, uh, and you have a choice to make. In fact, it's not unlike the choice that, that Esau had to make. It's your uncle. It's not unlike the choice that Reuben made. He's your brother. It's not unlike the choice that Judah made just a chapter ago, and he's your brother too. Joseph, you are surrounded by examples of people that lost control, that did not bridle their passions, and didn't care enough about the covenant to put that first and foremost in their eye. No, they, they let their eye go elsewhere. So, Joseph, what are you going to do? Verse 8, he refused. He just straight up said no. He wouldn't do it. He said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not, or he knoweth not, what is with me in the house. He hath committed all that he hath in my hand. Now, with that, he could have actually used that as justification. He could have said, Well, my master did give me everything, and free reign in his household, no limits except just as long as I see bread on my table. Well, does that include his wife? Eh, why not? Uh, could he have used that position to rationalize? Or even could he have used his position, not just in Potiphar's home, but away from his own home? I'm out of town, huh? Just like Judah was. Nobody knows that I'm here or knows what I might do here. Just like happened with Judah out, out of town in Timnath. Wait a minute, I could get away with something and never have to pay the price just like Judah got to keep his goat. Oh, is that what's going on in, in Joseph's mind? Absolutely not, because look at verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. It's like, come on, he's your husband. Is there no loyalty here? I'm not looking for any loopholes. I'm not trying to rationalize away what would be sinful. I will not do this to my master. I will not sin against Potiphar. But more than that, notice the last phrase. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Far more than sinning against my master, lowercase m, I will not sin against my master, capital M. You are Potiphar's wife. I won't cross that line. But I am God's servant, and I won't cross that one. It doesn't matter that my, that my brothers betrayed me and have no idea where I am. It doesn't matter that my father thinks I'm dead and therefore will never come looking. It doesn't matter that your husband might be away and, and will never catch wind of this if we keep the secret. That doesn't matter. It's God's all-seeing eye that I honor. And he will know. And that's all that matters to me. I will not sin against God. Oh, if only Judah had felt that way in chapter 38. 
if Reuben had felt that way in chapter 35, if Esau had felt that way in chapter what, 32, I'm losing track of my numbers now. I actually remember teaching this to my seminary students 20 years ago. And I think it was, I can't remember, right before fall break or something maybe, but uh, the students left for fall break and this one young man came back and I was just asking the students, hey, how was your fall break? Where'd you go? What'd you do? And he came back with a photograph uh, and, he, and he handed it to me. Uh, he said, oh, I had to print this out and give you a copy. This was classic based on what we talked about with Joseph in Egypt. I'm like, what? And I looked at this picture and it was, the, it was, the, <laughs> it was hilarious. This student was, he nailed it with this photo. He said, we went to New Mexico on spring break. And I'm like, what's in New Mexico? And he said, exactly. Uh, no offense to anyone who lives in New Mexico. I've been through, it's beautiful, uh, land of enchantment, right? I've been to Carlsbad Caverns. There are beautiful, beautiful parts of that, of that wide open desert, okay? But it is wide open desert. And, and this student was laughing, going, yeah, there was like nothing. For miles and miles and miles, as far as the eye could see, we'd just be going on the freeway trying to get to our destination, but there's, there was nothing. And then in the middle of nowhere, I saw this. And we had to pull over and take a picture. The picture showed a, a building. Call it, assume that it's a house of ill repute because it, I think it was painted bright pink. And around the outside of the whole building was this black stripe with big white letters that just said XXX, repeated from like every angle. So that from a distance, as you're going down the freeway, not seeing anything else in sight, you'd see this triple X, this X-rated building. And you just, I guess, have to assume what was inside. But if you wanted to more than assume and actually see for yourself, well, there's a good place to do it. As this student and I were laughing about it afterwards, like, man, if you want to sin, do it in New Mexico. <laughs> Go to somewhere, go out of town where nobody knows you, go to the middle of nowhere where no one will find out and live it up. Do whatever you want because you'll never have to pay the piper. But here's what made that photograph so classic. Because right above that house of ill repute, right above that den of iniquity, some enterprising Christian had erected a billboard that had a picture of Jesus, and it said in equally large print as the triple X down below, Jesus is watching. And this student just died laughing, going, in the middle of nowhere, here it is, just, how can I sin against God? Uh, no one else on earth may be aware of what you're about to do. But someone with a divine vantage point is more than aware. And so he took that picture and brought it back to me. And I'm like, wow, that is Genesis 39.9 to a T. And less tempted by the building below, Joseph is well aware of the eyes from above. And he will not offend them. He will not sin against God. I love that. Now verse 10, back to Potiphar's wife. It came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or be with her. Well, there's an example of Satan's persistence day by day. This was not a one time you resist the temptation and now I'm completely done with it. No, you might have to resist that temptation over and over and over again, especially sins that are addictive in nature. And that just might describe every sin. Sinfulness itself is addictive. And the adversary will keep knocking on our door day by day. Now, remember we saw this earlier. He's not very, he's, he's not good at endurance, but boy, is he good at persistence. So if he is persistent, we better be consistent and consistently say no, as Joseph did. He hearkened not. But notice the end. She sounds like she's changing her tune. At the beginning, first words we heard was lie with me. Here it's, well, lie by me, or even softer, be with me. But has the, has the ultimate goal really changed? Like I said, worse, first sins become worst sins, but they grow in the meantime. And it's interesting that she starts backing up and saying, well, how about something innocent? Just lie by me. And it's sad to see 
how close people try to get to the line of immorality, as long as they can justifiably say, I didn't cross it. I joked with this with my students in Tennessee that if you have ever seen, I actually heard this example from my uncle about cows. He spent time on the ranch when he was a kid and he'd see these cows sticking their neck through the barbed wire fence to go lick some piece of grass as far as their tongue could reach. And that cow could, could honestly say, hey, I never crossed the fence. I stayed inside. At least my four hooves did. Well, yeah, but what about your, your neck? What about your head? What about the tip of your tongue? I was joking with my students in Tennessee going, because I mean, there was lots of barbed wire fences and lots of cows all over the place. And it was like, have you ever seen it? They're like, oh yeah, all the time. And I'm like, what? And especially in Tennessee, there's, there's grass everywhere. And I just want to tell the cow, you're surrounded by, ca- by grass. You're in the meadow. What's so much better about the, the blade on the other side? Is the grass greener? Well, I guess the cow thought so. I actually had some artistic students sent, give me a... a a going away present as I left Tennessee. And it was a cow in a pasture surrounded by grass. And just this, there's grass all around you, cow. (laughs) It's like God has blessed you with opportunities everywhere. He's even blessed you with, with the promise of intimacy within the bounds that he has set. And I picture a good cow saying, oh, I have all the grass I need right here. I can be faithful, I can be chaste, or I can be patient and obedient in the meantime. And that's exactly how Joseph felt about all this. Now, I'll admit, Genesis 39 is pretty sparse on the detail. And this is actually where Josephus can come in handy. In his book on the antiquities of the Jews, it's actually a fascinating resource to see a Jewish historian trying to put in perspective the Old Testament, his people's history, for the people of his day, which was right around the time of Christ. The Antiquities of the Jews, he says this about the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He therefore exhorted her to govern that passion and laid before her the impossibility of obtaining her desires, which he thought might be conquered if she had no hope of succeeding. And he said that as to himself, he would endure anything, whatever, before he would be persuaded to it. I'm so impressed with what Joseph just did there. I mean, assuming Josephus got it right. Because it's not just for his sake that he's not budging, it's for Potiphar's wife's sake. Once you come to terms with the impossibility of my immorality, then your morality might become more of a possibility. Once you just finally decide, I will not be immoral, it's so much easier to keep that. Once you've made a covenant, once you've, you've promised your eye, to borrow Job's example, Just stick with it. Once you wrap your heart around virtue and have made the decision, then you don't have to remake the decision every single day, day by day, as you keep propositioning me. It's not going to work. Leave it. Another phrase from Josephus. She assured him that if he complied with her affections, he might expect the enjoyment of the advantages he already had. Nothing of, none of that's going to change. And if he were submissive to her, he should have still greater advantages. Don't you get it? I can reward you even more than my husband already has. But, Josephus goes on, but that he must look for revenge and hatred from her in case he rejected her desires. If he resisted her, he would gain nothing by such procedure, as she would then become his accuser and would falsely pretend to her husband that he attempted her chastity. Now back to Genesis, we know that's exactly what she did. But according to the Josephus' version, she warned him that that would be the case. Oh, and if that doesn't make you want to justify immorality, it's like, well, I'm going to get punished for it whether or not I do it? Well, I might as well do it then. Hmm, no, that's that's not where Joseph's mind goes. But that thought, that extra reward, that threat of punishment on the other side, it doesn't change Joseph's mind. Another phrase from Josephus, though the woman said thus, and even with tears in her eyes, right? There's the day by day, there's the persistence, there's the pleading. But Joseph was not dissuaded from his chastity, nor induced by fear to a compliance with her. But he opposed alike her solicitations and her threatening and was afraid to do an ill thing, choosing rather to undergo the sharpest punishment 
than to enjoy his present advantages by doing what his own conscience knew would justly deserve that he should die for it. I'd rather die than break a law of chastity in that way. No, I won't go there. You can threaten me, you can promise me, it will fall on deaf ears because I've decided. How can I sin against God? I still bear the coat of many colors, no matter how long it's been since I've seen it. Finally, one last beautiful detail from Josephus. Joseph says to Potiphar's wife, It is much better to depend on a good life known to have been so than upon the hopes of the concealment of evil practices. Oh, I love that. Hoping to avoid getting caught, which is what Judah had been trying to do back in Timnath. No, I would much rather just trust in the goodness of a life well lived. Even if people misjudge me, since you've falsely accused me, I'll know, God will know, my conscience will be clear. And that's what matters most to me. Well, none of that satisfied Potiphar's wife. So verse 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house that were within. Interesting timing. She's been persistent. It's been day by day. She's, she's softening her arguments. She's trying other tactics, but she's after the same thing. And this time she waits until they're alone. And that's often the case with the adversary too, especially with immoral sins. If there's a way to keep this, I mean, maybe even New Mexico is too public a place. So let's make sure that we're completely alone in this. Interesting also, he was going into, his, into the house to engage in business. And, and that's often when the adversary strikes as well, trying to stop us from doing our master's work. If, if he can get in the way of that, and especially if he can think that we're going to get away with it, then of course he'll strike. Then verse 12, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. I have pictured Joseph there. We're like, what is it with my coats? Why is everybody trying to, ah, my brother's with the coat of many colors, Potiphar's wife with his servant's robe. Fine, I'll leave it. Now, it's become crystal clear what she's been after all along. We, we knew that from the start. Lie with me is the first thing. Lie with me is the last thing. So that, that, that softened sin earlier on was just smoke and mirrors. Oh, just lie by me. We won't do anything. Oh, just be with me. We can just hang out. Oh, be so careful when the ultimate destination hasn't changed at all. He knows it's always been that way. He's known to always avoid it. But now she's got him by the coat. She caught him. And what I love about his reaction is, then you can keep that. If there's a part of me that the adversary has a hold on, then I'll just leave it with him and get out of here. If there are certain places we go or things we do or influences we are exposed to, Please be, be honest with yourself. We all need to be. Because as we ponder, what is the adversary holding on to in my life? What are my media choices? What's my circle of friends? Where are those areas of influence that are, that are holding me fast, that have caught me, that I could honestly leave behind? And, and cancel that subscription or turn off the TV or close the laptop or, or just walk away. Or in Joseph's case, run away. That's, that's better counsel. He left the coat in her hand. He fled. He got him out. Elder Maxwell used to joke and said, yeah, that showed good morals, but also really good legs. And sometimes that's exactly what it takes. Uh, after Jesus said no to the adversary, tempting him to t turn stones to bread, he didn't just stay there on the mountainside looking at rocks that looked more, more like rolls and stones that, wow, that kind of, kind of a croissant there. No, he got him out. He left. In fact, he went to the temple. 
Interesting choice. And here's Joseph doing likewise. He doesn't stand around discussing things with Potiphar's wife. When it's push come to shove and it looks like it's, this is the moment of greatest alarm. I'm out of here. And that's, and that's where he went. Now, verse 13, it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. She called unto the men of her house. I guess they weren't that far away after all. Uh, chance to get caught all around you. She spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew. So now we're taking advantage of his outsider status. He's not one of us. This is a Hebrew. He brought him unto us to mock us. Now she's playing on her pride, playing on their pride. He's making fun of us Egyptians. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. Talk about false accusation. In fact, talk about hypocrisy. Talk about self-deception. Yeah, you're trying to deceive the servants. Who you've really deceived is yourself. This is all you. Potiphar's wife is actually the Judah figure here. Falsely accusing Tamar of something he'd done wrong. Joseph has been innocent the entire time. Now verse 16, she laid up the garment by her. I'm just going to keep this as exhibit A. Until his Lord came home. So this is the just wait till your father comes home. Just wait till the master. One thing for the servants to see this and be shocked. But for the master to see it. And again, Joseph would say, oh, it's the real master I've been worried about. Not the lowercase m one. But just wait, she says. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, again, outsider status, which thou hast brought unto us. So this is partly, your, this is more your fault, honey, than it is mine. Came in unto me to mock me. So you better come to my, you know, there were honor killings in Shechem. There better be an honor killing here in, in Egypt. He came to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me, fled out. Here's the proof. Sure enough, 19, it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, when she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Compare that to the even-keeled Jacob, who had absolute knowledge that his daughter had been raped. Well, here's Potiphar with no real proof. Circumstantial evidence, yes, but filled with anger about this. Wrath kindled. Can't blame him if the story were true, but is it? No. Here's an emotional reaction. Here's jumping to conclusions. Here's hearing only one side of the story. When you already know so much about, about Joseph, he has a long track record with you. And everything he does turns to gold. You know that, Potiphar. You trust him, and you've had all kinds of evidence that God prospers everything you have because of everything Joseph is. By the way, that's an important thing to understand when, when you stumble across, whether it's actual anti-Mormon literature, or it might actually be true but taken out of context or some piece of church history thrown in your face to, that is sensationalized and superficial and selective. Those are the three S's I always warn people about. Most anti-religious rhetoric is those, are those three, sensational, superficial, and selective. Well, what's happening here? Boy, is it sensational. My servant, my slave, tried to rape my wife. They're sensational. Superficial? Oh, I just have this circumstantial evidence. Here's this, this coat in my wife's hand. Uh, well, but it, is that the smoking gun? That's all I need? And then selective? You've only heard one side of the story. And it came from, from one that definitely had uh, a reason to be biased. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you calm down. And you don't jump to conclusions. And you don't rush into an emotional reaction. That's overcoming the sensationalism. Secondly, you try to go deeper than just surface level understanding. What really happened here? As servants, anybody see anything? Uh, I, I want to go deep on this and really investigate it fully. And then selective, 
Well, if there were two involved here, I do want to hear Joseph's side of the story. Um, and, and then we'll see. I'm not going to jump to conclusions in either direction. I want to go beyond the selectivity or the superficiality or the sensationalism. Well, maybe Potiphar did, maybe he didn't. But what's interesting is the result of all of this. Now, if you're captain of the king's, of of Pharaoh's guard, if you're a chief executioner or even just a chief butcher, if you're a court official, any, no matter what he is, he's a per- person in power, he's got authority, and if he's used to blood in any way, and this is a, just a slave that just tried to, to rape your wife, I mean, death penalty. Even, I mean, Josephus' version, Joseph himself said, oh, that's something to, to, to die over. Well, what's the result? Verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now that's an incredible, well, harsh sentence for someone that's completely innocent, but incredibly light sentence for someone that, if he were guilty of such a crime as that. It does make you wonder if Potiphar got past the three S's. And yes, filled with, with wrath, but then let it pass and thought a little bit longer. Got past the sensationalism, dug deeper than the superficiality, went beyond the selective and, and maybe sent him to prison so that his wife could save face or so that he could save face. There has to be some kind of punishment if this is what everyone's been led to believe. But Joseph, I, I always trusted you. And you never gave me any reason to question that. And even now that there is reason to question that, I'll have to give you at least some benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to pass final judgment with an execution, even with imprisonment. It buys me time to figure things out. Anyone who's wrestling with things and thinking, oh, I read this thing about Joseph Smith. Okay, great, fine. But what else do you know about Joseph Smith? What other track record has he given you? What other sides of the story are there? When somebody throws some smoking gun in your face and holds up the robe and says whatever they want to say about Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Russell M. Nelson or, or anyone in the church, just pause. Calm down, let the emotion, let the sensational pass, and think. Dig deeper. Hear both sides of the story. Act in faith. See the big picture. What other evidence do you have? What track record have these men and women of God given you? Don't jump to conclusions, especially not a final judgment that doesn't give you or them any chance to change or explain or anything like that. I think there's some some important relevance here. But regardless of Potiphar's perceptions, Joseph is in prison, and there's no change in that, at least not yet. But despite the inability to change his circumstances, how he maintains an incredible attitude throughout. In verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. It's like we saw at the beginning of the chapter. God showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. I mean, the the chapter's about to end, but we see it coming full circle. How did it begin? Here's Joseph, a slave, but he doesn't act like one, uh, and he's not treated as one. God is with him. God prospers him. In fact, he prospers Potiphar. And what's happening by the end? He's now re-enslaved. A prisoner, in some ways it's now even worse, but God's with him, he's merciful to him, he finds favor in the sight of his new master, the jail keeper, and then the chapter ends, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, with Joseph. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Like I said, comes full circle. This chapter has 
starts on a very down, but it comes up quickly, and then another down, and then it's coming up quickly. It's the roller coaster of life. Welcome to it. But despite circumstances, Joseph doesn't change. He's steady throughout the entire thing, and he trusts God throughout it all. It's amazing to me that he does, but God is with him. A slave that doesn't feel like a slave, a prisoner that doesn't feel like a prisoner, a slave that isn't treated like a slave, a prisoner who's not treated like a prisoner, a slave who ascends and basically becomes the master of his master's house, and a, and a, a prisoner who ascends and basically becomes the jail keeper more than the jail keeper himself. Oh yeah, I know I'm on the, the wrong side of the bars, but inside I'm not. I'm okay. And as long as God is with me in my trial, it doesn't feel like I'm imprisoned after all. I'll make the most of this. He always did. Now in prison, the story continues, and we're well aware of this one, he, uh, there are more dreams. Dreams kind of got him into this mess, right? Well, dreams are going to get him out of it. Well, I should say the reaction of his brothers to his dreams got him into this mess. Uh, his, his reaction to the butler and baker's dream uh, will lead to some, some later dream interpretation in a chapter uh, to come. Now, verse 1, it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. Now that again puts Joseph's alleged indiscretion into perspective. That he got the same punishment as Pharaoh's servants that merely offended him in some way? I doubt that Pharaoh would have been so forgiving if, someone had, if the butler or the baker had tried to seduce his wife. Well... Regardless, there they are in prison, and in verse 3, Pharaoh puts them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. And what did Joseph do? He served them, and they continued a season in ward. Now, I've read that sometimes in POW camps or in concentration camps, like in World War II, when a prisoner was elevated to a kind of go-between position between the guards and their fellow prisoners, often in order to ingratiate themselves with the guards and try to lessen their own sentence or lessen the danger of, of retribution or fear or punishment, whatever it might be, often those, those middlemen became so much more like their their jailers than like their fellow prisoners. And in some ways, they became even more ruthless, even more hateful or harmful, even more evil toward their fellow prisoners than the guards themselves were. I don't know if there's just something twisted about human nature that makes that the case, but Joseph doesn't have that problem. I'm not going to be extra mean to these people to show the jailers just how much like them I can be. No, I'm going to serve them. Here's the chief becoming servant of all. Sound familiar? Here is one that doesn't... I mean, I'm innocent. You guys did do something wrong. And so I'm going to judge you or treat you harshly. No, I know my innocence. And even if you know your guilt, I'll treat you innocently. Or at least treat you kindly and generously. I'll serve you, and that's what he does. Now... As the story continues, both the butler and the baker end up having dreams one night. And they wake up, and, and Joseph sees the two of them and asks what has got to be the oddest question to ever ask a fellow prisoner in prison. Verse 7, he says, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? <laughs> you get it? He's surprised that they look sorrowful in prison. And I picture them looking at him going, Are you kidding me? Look around. Uh, the, the, the cell walls, the bars, uh, the poor treatment, any of that suggests any of the reasons I might not be having my best day. <laughs> and yet the fact that Joseph is surprised by their sorrow lets you know he doesn't share in it. Oh yeah, that's right, we are in jail. <laughs> I, I forget. Because I don't feel like a prisoner. Uh, my spirit is free, my conscience is clear, I can go about serving people, which 
is what I did back in Potiphar's house. It's what I did back in my father's house. It's what I intend to do even when I get out of here, if I ever do. If not, oh well, here I am. And God is with me. The fact that he would join me in my chains. The fact that rather than just release me, he would suffer alongside me. That's the atonement. That Christ would condescend to join us in jail. To be a fellow prisoner. Or as Paul said, to to be part of the fellowship of suffering. Joseph was a fellowship of sufferers with the butler and baker, but why so sad? It's all about attitude in adversity. Then verse 8, they said unto him, well, let's be clear, we have dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter of it, which suggests that revelation does still require interpretation. That knowledge has to be implemented somehow before it becomes real wisdom. Remember Joseph's phrase when he was working on scripture, that the true meaning and intention of their mysterious passages came to our understanding like never before. Meaning, well, I know what the what my dream was about, I can, expl- I can tell you that, but interpretation, it's intention. What am I supposed to do about it? What exactly does it signify or symbolize? I need an interpreter. And that's true of scripture too. I am so thankful for past prophets who produced scripture, but I am equally grateful for living prophets that can help us interpret it. And that is what the scriptures mean. That's how Joseph says it at the end of one of his explanations, right? Only prophets can say that. Well, Joseph has this gift. He was a dreamer himself, and now he shows that he is an interpreter of dreams as well. Gift of tongues, gift of interpretation of tongues. In a way, Joseph has both. So, verse 8 continues with Joseph saying to them, Well, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me then, I pray you. So I'm not looking for interpretation alone. I'm looking for revelation for interpretation. Uh, If this dream came from God, then its interpretation would have to come from God, too. If if you just ate something weird last night, uh, and it's some strange dream, then I guess I could probably try to come up with some kind of explanation. Uh, I, I can be your psychoanalyst, but that's probably not what you want. You probably want real truth here. We'll talk more about the difference here when we get to Daniel at the end of the year, by the way. Him, Daniel uh, interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream is one of my favorite examples of the difference between revelation and interpretation. So we'll hold off on some of that till then. But, but Joseph's understanding is identical to Daniel's. In fact, there's a lot of really cool parallels between Israel in Egypt, here personified as Joseph, and Israel in Babylon during the days of Daniel and Ezekiel. Uh, We'll see those at the end of the year. But here you have a man with a a gift of understanding, but he knows the gift comes from God. So you explain, tell me the dream, I'll turn to God. Tell me, not that I'm just going to tell you right back, but I'll know how to go to God then and receive an, an understanding that comes from him. No mere psychoanalysis of some kind of emotional state that you were in. No, I want divine interpretation for what I consider divine revelation. Let's turn to God. So the chief butler starts. He said, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth. The clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Now Joseph understands it immediately. And says, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. So far, so good. And in some ways, anybody could have come up with that. But here's the part where true revelation is taking place. No psychoanalyst, rather a prophet. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head, and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, after the former manner, when thou wast his butler. But then he adds this, and it's so beautiful. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So it wasn't cluelessness that kept him from from his own sorrow. He understood what he was in. He knew the situation. He just had faith in the Lord and was 
okay with being there because God was in the prison with him. If there's a way to get out, by all means. It's one of my favorite lines from one of the letters Joseph Smith wrote from Liberty Jail. He's writing the saints in Nauvoo and he's like, you know, we tried to escape. We failed. But the jailer didn't blame us. <laughs> I love that. The jailer's like, yeah, I probably would have tried to get out of this too. And I think God would say the same of us. I don't blame you for trying to find a way out of your problems. That's good. Uh, be proactive. Exercise your agency. Look for solutions, ways to fix the problems you're in. Don't allow your submission to become so extreme that it's just despondency. No, try. Fight for yourself. Okay? Advocate for yourself. Plead and pray. Offer. Give me a will to offer on the altar. That's what Jesus did. That's what Joseph did. Here you get a sense that here's Joseph doing the same, this Joseph doing the same thing. Please remember me. Think on me when it's well. He had so much confidence in the explanation, the interpretation God had given him. I know things are going to be good for you within the next three days. Which means my deliverance could be three days away too. If you'll just tell Pharaoh that I'm not here justly. And his mercy can then intervene. In fact, his justice could intervene. I don't deserve to be here. Well, we'll see in a moment that the butler doesn't remember. But even the way it was phrased does again make me think of Jesus. Because who, knowing that Jesus would soon be delivered, pled to be remembered by him? Remember the thief on the cross crucified right alongside him? First chides his fellow thief, going, why are you... Why are you speaking this way to him? We deserve what we got. And the butler and baker on either side of Joseph could have said the same. We offended Pharaoh. We're here on, for good reason. He's innocent. He hasn't done a thing. So be careful how you respond here. But, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I know things will be better for you. Please make them better for me. And Jesus does. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, when the role is reversed and it's the butler, he doesn't remember Joseph, though Joseph begs him to remember me. Well, the baker wants to be remembered too. And in verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he's like, oh, okay, well, that one worked out well for him, maybe the same for me. So he says to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there were all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. So let me guess, right? Three baskets is three days, and, and the birds come down, so I'm going to be lifted up out of my affliction and restore. I'm going to soar back on eagle's wings into Pharaoh's good graces, right? Well, that's what he wanted to hear, but one of the great things about prophets is they don't just say what people want to hear. If it's good news, they'll give it, but if it's bad news, they'll give it too, and it's bad news for the baker. Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yes, you were right on that. But yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Whoa. Joseph doesn't sugarcoat this. He knows the bad news, and he conveys it clearly. Uh, I'm sorry, I sometimes have to be the, the bearer of bad tidings. But I'll do that whenever God commands. Well, sure enough, verse 20, It came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. He was just feeling festive that day and forgiving as a result. So he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Well, not all forgiving. He restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So Joseph got it right. And it's important that he did, because as we'll see the next chapter unfold, that's what's going to save his own skin. It's what's going to draw him out of prison and put him into round three of, of rising to power from a place of absolute nothingness. 
uh, a third round of finding beauty out of ashes. He did it uh, in Potiphar's house. He did it in the prison. And third time, he's going to do it with Pharaoh himself. That's just one chapter away. But before we get it, just one word about the symbolism of all of this. Joseph understood the symbolism within those dreams. And they had to do with bread and wine, life and death, and three days in prison. Hmm. Sound like anything. To me, there's something profound about that. If we ever hope to rise to the king's court, then we too, too need to understand clearly the significance of those symbols. What do we see behind the bread and the wine? Do we understand life and death and which ultimately overcomes? Do we trust that after three days of prison, Someone rose again and rose with healing in his wings to set the rest of us free as well. Someone who will indeed remember us and bring us home to paradise. Now, back to the story here. This chapter ends with the chief butler not remembering Joseph. He forgot him. And it makes me wonder if Joseph was feeling forgotten by a lot more than just the butler. Forgotten by my brothers, forgotten by my father, forgotten by God. Why does this keep happening to me? I thought, best case scenario, three, maybe four days from now, I'd be free. He would plead my cause. They, he, they would know my innocence and things would change. But two years later, is what we see with the turning of one page. Chapter 41 begins, it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he stood by the river. So that's how much time has passed since we turned the page from chapter 40. Two full years of wondering, when is that butler gonna remember me? I know what happened to him. I told him it would be that way. I asked him to think kindly upon me. Let Pharaoh know. And this is the, a way worse day by day than what Potiphar's wife put me through. I'm just wondering, is today the day? No, tomorrow the day? Day after? Two years have passed, feeling forgotten. And yet, I think we can safely assume about Joseph that he wasn't wallowing in self-pity through that time. He probably just went back to his work, uh, serving fellow prisoners as second in command to the jailer himself. Might as well have been first in command. He probably had the, the keys to the cells, but never used them to escape. He was trusted with everything. In fact, that story reminds me of one in the New Testament. It's so fascinating. Uh, Paul is in prison, and uh, there's a jailer there, and, and it, they shouldn't be in prison. He's just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there's an earthquake that night, and, and the prison walls crumble, and, and the jailer realizes that there are all the prisoners are going to escape and I'm going to be slain because I was on guard duty tonight. So he pulls out a sword ready to fall on it himself. He's like, they're going to kill me. I might as well just save them the trouble and, and take my own life. But then in the darkness and through these clouds of, of debris, whatever, smoke, dust, the jailer hears a voice and it's Paul's. And Paul says to him, don't kill yourself. We're still here. And I picture the jailer like, What? Nothing is keeping you here. Why didn't you run as soon as the, the walls fell down? And I picture Paul's response along the lines of, oh, because we were never in prison to begin with. I'm like, what? Yes, you were. It's like, well, technically, yes. But we were never on the wrong side of the bars. You were. Because we knew the truth, and the truth will set us free. You don't know the truth. And so you've been in the bondage to your own lack of belief, your lack of understanding. Can we help you with that? God obviously just set us free from your little prison, but can we help God set you free from yours? And the rest of that night, they stayed up learning the gospel as Paul teaches this jailer. And by the next day, he's ready to be baptized. It's one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts. 
And to me, it just suggests that, that prison is perception more than reality. No, no, we're on the right, right side of the bars. And Joseph felt the same way. I'm fine. I'll just go back to serving my fellow prisoners here in the fellowship of suffering. wonder why they look so sad today. Oh, well. Maybe I can cheer them up. Well, he definitely cheered up Pharaoh. Uh, although I wonder, there's a, there's a piece of me that wonders how, what's going on in the, in the butler's mind. Because like it said, it's been two years. Uh, the butler completely forgot about Joseph. He was probably just so stoked that it, he was right. I'm free. And poor, poor Baker, uh, he doesn't live to tell the tale. But what's interesting is as Pharaoh has these dreams, and there's two of them, okay, uh, we know the story well, so we don't have to read every single verse. Uh, it's, there's one about uh, cows in the river and one about grain growing on the ground. Uh, the, the, word, the text says corn, but that's a mistranslation from the King James. It's grain in Egypt. Corn was an American crop. Anyway, the, 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 the cows, first seven, are, I mean, cows on steroids, okay? I mean, they are as well-fed and, and, and muscular as you can imagine. Whereas the seven uh, cows that followed in their wake are, I mean, you can see the ribs through the skin. Uh, and yet the skinny ones, the famished ones, end up devouring the big ones. Like, how's that work? I know they're hungry enough to do it, but you'd think the, the, the buff ones would be able to defend themselves. No, they're gone. And Pharaoh wakes up and he's like shocked about this. And then he falls back asleep and has that round two of his dream where there's a, a stalk of wheat with, with seven heads that are so full. It's like, wow, I could probably make a, a loaf of bread just out of that one. But then there's another stalk that comes up that is so withered and blasted with the desert, uh, the wind from the desert, that it's just shriveled. And yet it seems to devour the good wheat with its seven heads. And again, he wakes up and what's up with that? And he's troubled and he can't, I think this was more than just what I ate last night. I, again, there's, I think, a message and a meaning here. So he asks around. In verse 8, it came to pass in the morning, his spirit was troubled he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, so all of his soothsayers, all of his astrologers, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Again, prophecy is not magic, nor is it just wisdom and, and well-informed prognostication. No, it is revelation from God. And to interpret, to understand God's will, it's going to take a prophet, not a magician, or even not a wise man. The learned still won't be able to read the book that is sealed. Well, that's when the light bulb finally comes on for Butler. It's like, <gasps> interpreting dreams, duh, what was I thinking? Oh, he's going to kill me. He's going to be so mad. Um, Verse 9, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. This is on me. He finally remembers Joseph. He tells Pharaoh about him and says, this guy I met in prison two years. Has it been that long? Yikes. Um, I had a dream. The, the baker had a dream. And this guy, he nailed it. It was exactly bad news, good news. I don't know. He, he didn't sugarcoat it. He told us exactly what he thought. And he was spot on in both instances. I'll bet he can interpret your dream too. Hope I don't lose my head. Again, there's no evidence uh, that when Joseph comes out of prison, they, they had to shave him. They had to change his clothing. Again, he's in a, in a rough state uh, physically. Although again, not emotionally, not spiritually. But they clean him up and bring him to Pharaoh. And I just picture the butler kind of behind a column somewhere in the palace. Like, <laughs> So, so sorry. It took me this long to remember you. But there don't seem to be any hard feelings on Joseph's part. It's like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. In fact, maybe this is the only real time I could have been brought out because there's a, a purpose here. And this is a chance for Pharaoh not just to hear my story secondhand from you and wonder, what? And then Potiphar? No, I trust Potiphar. It's fine. Leave him there. Whatever. No, this is a chance for Pharaoh to come to know me in a different scenario and to come to know my God, since it's God that's going to have to interpret this dream. Pharaoh can come to know my, my God just like Potiphar came to know my God. 
uh, just like the butler and the baker, in a way, came to know my God, since I gave him all the glory all the way through. That's what's going to happen here. So Pharaoh calls, sends for him. They bring him out of prison, clean him up. And in 15, he begins to explain it. I dreamed a dream. There's none that can interpret it. But I've heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. To which Joseph immediately responds, No, no, gentle correction, Pharaoh. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now, before we actually see the interpretation, which I know you're all probably well aware of, it's worth going back in time to 1998. Gordon B. Hinckley was president of the church. He was speaking in conference. And he said an interesting thing. He said, I want to make it very clear I am not prophesying. That I am not predicting years of famine in the future. But I am suggesting that the time has come to get our houses in order. There is a portent of stormy weather ahead to which we had better give heed. And he quoted Pharaoh's dream. Basically said, I just can't get this dream out of my head. I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying there's a famine ahead. But I can't stop thinking about this dream. Now, when a prophet can't stop thinking about something, even if he says, I'm not prophesying, we should probably, like, are you really not prophesying? Uh, I, I think it's more than just dropping hints, because evidently God is doing more than dropping hints on you. What would you have us know, President Hinckley? And he talked about consumer debt. He talked about living beyond our means. He talked about the possibility of global economic crisis. Uh, he talked about the church always being careful financially, never to go into debt, never to live beyond its means. In fact, to lay up in store for times of emergency or rainy days. And you may want to go back and read that talk, especially since it's now in hindsight. For him to have this non-dreamy dream or this non-prophetic prophecy, boy, was it prophetic. Because if that was 1998, October, by the spring of 2006, which is just over seven years later, the housing bubble burst and the Great Recession began. I was looking at some of the dates here, and how's this for data? In 2006, one and a quarter million homes were foreclosed on, which was up 42% from the year before. The following year, two and a million foreclosures, up 75% from the year before. The next year, over three million foreclosures. The next year, almost four million foreclosures. Home prices plummeted throughout 2006 and 2007. By 2008, the home price index had the sharpest drop that it had ever had in its history. It reached new lows by 2012, which was 14 years after President Hinckley's talk, which is when housing prices started to rebound and the economy started to turn around, not just in the United States, but, but worldwide. I'm not trying to prophesy. I'm not saying that uh, there's going to be years of plenty and years of famine, but that is exactly what happened. Uh, there were seven years of plenty. There was the housing bubble growing. There was the dot-com bubble growing. There was, people were doing really well those years until it all fell apart. And seven years of plenty were followed, roughly speaking, by seven years of famine. And there have been ups and downs ever since. Say what you will about President Hinckley's words. They were incredibly relevant then. And Pharaoh's dream was as relevant as it gets. No matter what type of economic cycle we're in, and bear markets and bull markets and whatever it might be, the counsel is wise that, that President Hinckley gave. The counsel is wise that, that Joseph will give. And in fact, that's the beauty of it. He gives more than interpretation. He gives counsel on what to do about it. True meaning, true intention. What are we going to do from here? It's amazing as it unfolds. Now, we, like I said, we know the story. Pharaoh explain, or tells the dreams to Joseph. In fact, he includes a couple other details than what we got when we read him have the dreams in the first place. One that I find interesting, verse 19, when he talks about the lean cows, Pharaoh says, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. In other words, I've never seen anything this bad. I mean, those 
skinny cows were, were hunting. Uh, in other words, this is going to be an unprecedented challenge. Oh, there's always fat years and lean years, but there's going to come something like we've never seen before. Now, again, is this economic collapse that we're talking about? Maybe, maybe not. I think the dream can, interp can be interpreted in all kinds of different ways, especially in our life, whether it's your finances or your faith, whether it's your prosperity or your popularity. We all seem to live through these cycles and since the one that always interests me the most is the faith one, it is interesting to try to re-see this, this dream in terms of faith crisis or faith transitions or times where you are on fire in your faith to the point that you don't think you'll ever come down from the mountaintop. Well, life has its way of, of shaking everyone. Earthquakes in diverse places, right? Will we still hold on to our faith? Can we remain unshaken through all of this? That's my hope. But when Pharaoh talks about badness in these, in these cattle, like he had never seen before, we are living in a day of, of doubt uh, on a global level. We're seeing a loss of faith uh, in in the future, loss of faith in each other, loss of faith in God. Uh, a, Elder Maxwell said a fascinating thing. This is just not some, some wave of doubt that will come and crash and then, and then pass. He said, no, this is now the secular sea itself. We're seeing things that we've never really seen before. And are we prepared for it? Or will our years of famine devour our years of faith? You can be on fire on your mission, or in a church calling, or at some time where you've immersed yourself in Scripture for hours on end every week. Are you laying up in store? Will you remember, or like the butler, will you find yourself forgetting, even though you never thought you would? You see, that's what happens in another later verse in Pharaoh's explanation. It's really interesting. 21, when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. Later on, when they're explaining all this, the verse 30, it says, all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. See, that's the interesting thing about human nature and how easy it is for us to forget our good times in our bad times to the point that the bad years gobble up the good years. It happens in marriage when, when marriage goes from creation to fall stage. And if you don't have a hope in an atonement stage later on, then yes, all of the hardship can turn around and gobble up, devour any good memories until you start to even question why did I marry you in the first place? Or, we, I never loved you to begin with, which is a straight up lie, or you never would have gotten married at all. But it is amazing. Same thing with people who leave the church and in their fall stage and look back at the creation stage. And if they're past nostalgia and onto bitterness, that's usually how it goes, then they can't even remember the good times. And you're looking at them going, what? We were mission companions. Or, I'm your parent, and I know the spiritual experiences you've had. Or, you know what I mean? And it's this, can you really not remember? That was Nephi's question to Laman and Lemuel. An angel came to us. Seriously? But it is amazing that in times of doubt, faith can be completely overshadowed. It can be devoured to the point you don't even remember it. That's especially true when the years go beyond anything you've seen, seen before. Remember? I've never seen cattle this bad than in my dream. Unprecedented challenges. L faith lost like never before. Now that should tell us something. If it's a problem like you've never seen, then you're going to have to have a solution that you've never had to use. Desperate times call for desperate measures, right? They're, we're going to have to think outside the box. We're going to have to think above ourselves on this. Lest the good years get completely swallowed up. So what will I do during my good years? And that's where Joseph comes in to help. Verse 25, he says to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Yes, you had two, but it's the same one, just two different versions. 
God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now that's the equivalent of Amos 3.7, that God won't do anything unless he reveals his secrets, that which God is about to do, to his servants, the prophets. Well, wait, he, but he revealed the secret to, to Pharaoh. Well, yeah, but he revealed, really, he, he answered the riddle. He unlocked the secret with Joseph. And it actually needed to be that way. If Joseph had had a dream originally, no one would have taken him seriously about his interpretation. Like, yeah, some guy in prison is dreaming about stuff, whatever. But if Pharaoh had had both the dream and the interpretation, then there's no reason for Joseph to meet him, and therefore no one in position to actually make the difference and save the day. God knows what he's doing here, okay? Separate dream from interpretation, but bring them together so that the people can come together, Pharaoh and Joseph. Well, Joseph then explains the dream, tells him what it's all about. He says, for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It's because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. President Iron used to say that, that repetition should rivet our attention. When you see something come up often in Scripture, or you, you hear prophets repeating things multiple times, well, Pharaoh, this is serious. This is going to happen. And the seven are years, and the fat and the lean are the plenty and the famine. You understand what's going on here? But beyond that, he does more than just explain the dream. He gives him counsel on what to do about it. And I think that's key. It's one thing for us to be able to point out someone else's problems. Fine. But can you help point them to a solution to them? Can you make some suggestions, give some wise advice that this is one way that you might be able to navigate this challenge? And that's exactly what Joseph does. Verse 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet, which means discerning or quick to observe, and wise, which means skillful and prudent. It's the same word that was used for Pharaoh's wise men. They just didn't live up to it. Anyway, find a discreet and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land. And then Joseph proceeds to explain the whole plan. It's like, okay, Pharaoh, um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, anybody got something to write on? Oh, Butler, hey, good to see you. Um, again, it's been a while. Uh, write this down. The next seven years are going to be plenteous, and that's an understatement. It's going to be amazing. Uh, later account, it describes it coming out by handfuls, okay? It's like, man, we plant a seed and then we get handfuls, armloads of, of produce. Well, uh, what we're going to do during those seven years of plenty is take one-fifth of that and lay it aside. Store it up. I know that sounds odd. You're not used to that. Most people spend everything they make. Uh, most people think that years of plenty will never be followed by years of, of lack or want. And so it's the, it's the law of creeping averages. And the average gets higher and higher and higher. Uh, there's an old, an old poem, Oh, there, there, little luxury, don't you cry. You'll be a necessity by and by. And that's how we live our lives. Instead of staying at a certain level, and allowing excess to either bless our future or bless someone else's present. Oh, there's so much more we can do than just spend everything on ourselves. And so we're going to do things different since it's a different set of circumstances that lies ahead. Lay up one-fifth. Now, one, and then we'll live off the one-fifth for the seven years of, of famine. Now, that makes me wonder. It's like, wow, how's that? Uh, really? We're going to go from plenty to living off one-fifth of the plenty? If we stay on average and we keep kind of the 100% model, are, are we going to live on 20% of our income later on? That's rough. Well, that's only the case if you use up everything you have now uh, beyond that 20%. On the other hand, if we stay steady uh, and depending on just how much the Lord blesses us in overabundance now, it won't be a 100 to 20 percent drop. Uh, if we can reduce what we're spending on ourselves now, if we can hold the line instead of just rushing into a life of luxury, then the ups and downs of the economy won't jerk us around quite so forcibly. 
And I'll be steady through the rich years and steady through the lean years because I'm not allowing circumstance to, to dictate my lifestyle. Sounds like Joseph in Egypt, all through it, whether it's Potiphar or uh, prison or now Pharaoh's court. Steady, okay, modest, living within our means, preparing for the future. And this isn't just economics, this is matters of faith as well. Am I establishing? How, it's hard to lay up in store faith, right? Uh, grain might be preserved for a while, but as Elder Iron has also said, great faith has a short shelf life. So what do we do about that? Well, that might take some more significant changes, uh, new solutions to new or pressing problems. And maybe it's a matter of establishing real habits and, and spending the time in seven years worth of ease where you're not up against spiritual challenges and you haven't been confronted with shadows of doubt, are you establishing habits that will carry you through the dark days? Are you writing down insight and inspiration? Are you recording the hand of God so you do have faith laid up in store so that it doesn't end up being forgotten and gobbled up by the years of spiritual famine? Can you make it through the dark night of the soul and a lot of that will depend on what we did during our days of, of spiritual light. Think about that. Ponder. Let the Holy Ghost help you decide what you can do during your, your fat years to get you through the lean ones. But as far as Joseph's plan is concerned, sounds great to Pharaoh. Verse 37, the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of all his servants, including the wise men that weren't so wise. Well, at least they're wise enough to recognize real wisdom when it appears. So 38, Pharaoh says to his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, this Joseph, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Remember, that was wise that he gave God the credit the whole time. Pharaoh says to Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. So Joseph, I mean, if discretion or discernment is what we're after, if wisdom and, and skill is what we seek, <laughs> you're obviously that guy. I don't know if you were applying for the position when you described that, but you did describe yourself to a T. Obviously, I mean, God has chosen you. I would be wise to choose you too. So, verse 40, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Which sounds just like Potiphar's response to him, just like the jailer's response to him. Rewind, just like Israel's response to him. Here's this coat of many colors. Well, now it's Pharaoh's turn to give him the coat of second of, in command. In fact, verse 41, Pharaoh says to Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Done deal. I already made up my mind. Uh, no, no votes to the contrary. Verse 42, then Pharaoh takes off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. So here's a new identity, a new authority, your own signet, your own seal. He arrayed him in vestures of fine linen. Like I said, there's your new coat of many colors. He put a gold chain about his neck. Oh, no longer the chains of prison or of slavery. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. That's a far cry from walking behind the camels of the Midianite caravan. And then the people cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. This servant was now the chief of all. Fitting, since when he was chief of all, all he ever did was serve. Verse 45, then Pharaoh changes his name. We've been seeing a lot of that. He calls him Zaphnath Paneah. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Now, there's a lot of names there. Uh, what exactly does Zaphnath Panea mean? That one's tricky, and scholars can't quite agree on it. It's not a Hebrew word. It's Egyptian. Some have suggested it means a preserver of life, and he would be. Some have suggested it meant a revealer of secrets. He had just done that. Others have suggested it means God speaks and he lives, 
And how's that for an Egyptian testimony of the Hebrew God? Wow, this is one actually speaks. This one actually tells of the future. Yeah, we have a God of the Nile, but not even she told us that the Nile was going to stop flooding so well in those seven years of famine. Oh, this God speaks and lives. Uh, Asenath, Asenath, I'm not sure the pronunciation, could mean belonging to the goddess, Nath or Nath, or she belongs to her father or gift of the sun god. Those are all Egyptian possibilities. Uh, there's a Hebrew possibility that's related to the word for peril or misfortune, which to me is beautiful to think from a Hebrew perspective, like during the days of my peril and misfortune, God blessed me. He, he brought beauty from ashes. He gave me a new life and a new name and a wife that would bring children into my world. We'll meet the sons she bears to Joseph in just a moment. There's even a sense, though, if it is perilous, well, that's the opposite of Joseph because everything he touches turns to gold. Well, man, if we were to join these, it's like Joseph's years of plenty and Asenath's years of, of famine, yeah, if, her, if her name means that, bind them and all will be well. Put Joseph in charge of all of this. And so this new life begins. Verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. 30 years old, not a bad age to begin your ministry. Understand what I'm saying there. Now verse 47. In the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls, like I mentioned. In 49, Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. Well, there's a nod towards Abraham's promised posterity. If your job is to feed them, I hope you have enough for every famished soul. I hope you can make sure that posterity, the, the house of Israel, the, the, the people of the world, down to the last grain of sand, are fed with the bread of life. So gather it, Joseph, and then go gather them. Verse 50, unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. So those years of plenty brought forth more than just grain. They brought forth two sons for Joseph and Asenath. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Joseph had suffered greatly. He had toiled long. But with the coming of this son, he wasn't looking back. He was looking forward. Looking forward with faith and with joy. I forgot my toil. It's all been worth it. This isn't son of sorrow. This is son at my right hand. This isn't, this isn't difficulty and trial or peril. This is Manasseh. This is a promise of good things to come. And then another brother on top of that. Verse 52, the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Even in adversity I was blessed. This is Adam, by the sweat of your brow you will bring forth bread all the days of your life. These years of plenty, work at it, Joseph, and I will bless you. And those blessings will carry you through any years of heartache or difficulty. The sweat will be worth it. And then verse 54, the seven years of dearth began to come. They began. It wasn't one day feast and the next day famine. It's gradual change, sometimes to the point that we mistake what's happening and the fluctuations of our faith. And we just assume all is well. And yeah, I'm still in the days of, of feasting. And so I don't have to worry quite so much yet. Well, careful. The dearth is beginning to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread, thanks to Joseph. In fact, thanks to Joseph, the land of Egypt had become the land of bread. It had become a house of bread. Or as you'd say that in Hebrew, it had become a Beth Lehem. So many beautiful parallels here. And as, as Jake, Joseph has changed Egypt to become the breadbasket of the world, 
as people are coming to Egypt to come to him, to come to the bread that he can provide them. Verse 55, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. It's amazing that Pharaoh's the one saying that. I don't know. Don't, why asking me? You think I run the place? No, that's Joseph. Uh, do whatever he tells you. And that's good advice. It's advice I took for myself. As soon as he started explaining things, I'm like, yep, this guy knows how to run it better than I do. Do people feel that way about members of the church? The house of Israel? Can we be trusted with everything? Would somebody say, go to them because they have the answers? They can tell you how to live a life worth living. They can tell you how to raise your children. They can help you lay up in store. They can give advice on providing for the poor and the needy. They have answers to your questions. So whatever they say, just listen, do. I hope that we're living in such a way that people know that our advice is worth taking and that our teachings are worth pondering and listening to, considering, accepting, acting upon. And then finally, verse 56 and 57, the famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Next week, we'll see that that includes Canaan and includes his brothers who are now in desperate need of the very help that only Joseph can give them. Again, I hope we see ourselves here. Are we living our lives in such a way that when the world looks to Zion for aid, we have something to offer them? Have we laid up in store the bread of life? Do we know who we are and that that's our responsibility? Or have we forgotten? Has that coat of many colors been stripped from us and is so far in memory, off in our distant past, that it's worse than the butler not remembering us? We don't remember ourselves. Do we know our heavenly home? Do we know the coat of many colors that was hand spun or hand embroidered by loving parents far more exalted than, than even Jacob or Rachel were? Do we, do we sense what we've been sent to earth to do? Or do we get bogged down in our, in our momentary periods of, of slavery or servitude or imprisonment of being misjudged or falsely accused or feeling forgotten. Just don't forget that. Don't forget who you are. And don't forget the purpose for which you've been sent to earth. This is the family business. And Joseph, you're the birthright. It's time to make sure that all the rest of, not just the house of Israel, but all the families of the earth have the bread of life to eat. In fact, if I can close today's lesson by, by being apocryphal for a moment. I'm a fan of, of Doctrine and Covenants 91 that t says that, yes, the Apocrypha has some interpolations of man, but hey, if you have eyes to see, there's some truth there. And the Holy Ghost will help you benefit. Well, of all the parts of the Apocrypha, this is one to me that the Spirit is, can clearly testify there's truth here. It's called the Hymn of the Pearl, and it's beautiful. Although the focus is on the pearl, which this young man is sent to find, to go down to Egypt and to, to salvage this, this precious pearl uh, from a serpent that, has, that is keeping it, in order to bring that pearl back. This is a pearl of great price, okay? And bring it back to that heavenly home that this child has been sent from. Yes, it's the hymn of the pearl, but you could also call it the hymn of the coat the coat of many colors, the hem of a robe, because this young man is clothed in a heavenly garment, but then loses it, and in the process ends up forgetting who he really is. 
until he comes to himself, prodigal-like, and returns to be reclothed upon. Now that's the hymn in a nutshell. Let me actually read portions of it to you. From the apocryphal Acts of Thomas, probably written in the late second or early third century after Christ. When a quite little child, I was dwelling in the house of my father's kingdom, and in the wealth and the glories of my upbringers, I was delighting. From the east, our home, my parents forth sent me with journey provision. Indeed, from the wealth of our treasure, they bound up for me a load. Large was it, yet it was so light that all alone I could bear it. My glorious robe they took off me, which in their love they had wrought me, and my purple mantle, which was woven to match with my stature. And with me they made a compact, in my heart wrote it, not to forget it, if thou goest down into Egypt, and thence thou bringest the one pearl that lies in the sea, hard by the loud breathing serpent, then shalt thou put on thy robe and thy mantle that goeth upon it. And with thy brother, our second, shalt thou be heir in our kingdom. I left the east and went down with two couriers, for the way was hard and dangerous, and I was young to tread it. Down further I went into Egypt, and from me parted my escorts. Lone was I there, yea, all lonely, to my fellow lodgers a stranger. But from some occasion or other they learned I was not of their country. With their wiles they made my acquaintance, yea, they gave me their victuals to eat. I forgot that I was a king's son, and became a slave to their king. I forgot all concerning the pearl for which my parents had sent me. And from the weight of their victuals, I sank down into a deep sleep. Now from there, his parents sent him a letter. And it reads, From us, king of kings, thy father, and thy mother, queen of the dawn land, and from our second, thy brother, to thee, son, down in Egypt, our greeting. Up and arise from thy sleep, give ear to the words of our letter. Remember that thou art a king's son. See whom thou hast served in thy slavedom. Bethink thyself of the pearl for which thou didst journey to Egypt. Remember thy glorious robe. Thy splendid mantle remember to put on and wear as adornment. When thy name may be read in the book of the heroes and with our successor, thy brother, thou mayest be heir in our kingdom. After he reads the letter, he says, I remembered that I was a king's son and my rank did long for its nature. I bethought me again of the pearl for which I was sent down to Egypt. He lulls the serpent to sleep by chanting the name of his father and his mother and his brother. And then I snatched up the pearl and turned to the house of my father. Their filthy and unclean garments I stripped off and left in their country. To the way that I came, I betook me to the light of our home, to the dawn land, my glorious robe that I'd stripped off, and my mantle with which it was covered, down from the heights of Hyrcania, thither my parents did send me, by the hands of their treasure dispensers, who trustworthy were with it trusted. Without my recalling its fashion, in the house of my father, my childhood had left it. At once, as soon as I saw it, the glory looked like my own self. I saw it in all of me, and saw me all in it, that we were twain in distinction, and yet again one in one likeness. The glorious robe all bespangled with sparkling splendor of colors. The King of Kings image was depicted entirely all over it, and as with sapphires above was it wrought in a motley of color, and with its kingly motions was it pouring itself out towards me, and made haste in the hands of its givers that I might receive it. And me too, my love urged forward to run for to meet it, to take it. And I stretched myself forth to receive it. With its beauty of color, I decked me. And my mantle of sparkling colors, I wrapped entirely all over me. I clothed me therewith and ascended to the gate of greeting and homage. I bowed my head and did homage to the glory of him who had sent it whose commands I had accomplished, and who had, too, 
done what he'd promised. Do you see the story of Joseph there in so many details? All we've studied this week, all we'll study next week. But more than Joseph, do you see yourself there? That's my biggest hope. That you are daughters and sons of the King of Kings, of the Queen of the the Dawn Land, with an elder brother that is hoping that you will come home, pearl in hand, ready to be clothed upon. That glorious robe is our coat of many colors. It is the coat of covenant, and it was made to fit each one of us. I pray that we can live up to the mantle that God has made for you and me. It is a coat of many colors. And may we help the entire world see themselves embroidered into the fabric of faith. I testify that it was made for us and we were made for them. And so find the pearl, wear the coat, and gather all your brothers and sisters that they might feast upon faith with us.